sat down. Good morning, all. I want to thank you all for being here. I know a lot of you have flown in from a variety of different areas of our country uh, to be here and part of this panel. Um, so uh, I'm going to get to some of the rules. Uh, Gib, probably Mr. Mullen, probably uh, let you know what goes on here and that uh, you have five minutes for your statements and we'll go from order uh, from Mr. Judson all the way from what would be my left to right or I guess that's stage left to stage right. Uh, never really figured that out. Uh, so start with my opening statement. Uh, go ahead and start the time. Good morning and welcome to our hearing. I'm pleased to say that this is our fourth hearing in our Nation of Builder series and one that I've been looking forward to particularly because I get to welcome somebody from my hometown and frankly a one-time neighbor and that's George Kubat of, who is the CEO of Phillips Manufacturing, a company that I'm proud to have headquartered in my district and uh, particularly in South Omaha. A notorious, uh, I shouldn't say notorious, but a well-known blue-collar area of uh, my great city. Thus far in Congress, we've heard from the CEOs of largest steel companies in the U.S., representatives of the world's largest auto manufacturing companies, and even had a showcase displaying the wide range of products being manufactured in each of our districts on this subcommittee uh, panel. And today we're welcoming our home builders and manufacturers of products that are included in a home building. Of course, these industries are pretty different. A company like Ford, who testified in our hearing on auto manufacture, is markedly different in many ways from my constituent on today's panel, Phillips Manufacturing. One makes cars, the other makes corner beads used for drywall finishing. Clearly, their products are different. Their companies and are different sizes and serve different market sectors. Yet their message to our subcommittee is quite similar. Both the president of the Americas at Ford and Mr. Kubot from Phillips put three of the same issues in their top four areas for Congress to focus on. Now, I don't think these two business leaders know each other, but I doubt they worked in concert, but they were remarkably consistent when it came to identifying places where Congress can focus and as policy needs and improvements. They say we should pay attention to regulatory efficiency and certainty, tax reform, and worker education and training. Not surprisingly, the similarity between testimonies does not stop there. We have had over 35 witnesses testify our manufacturing hearings, and many of these themes and issues have been recurrent. It's time we start listening to these folks and what they're telling us and start look at ways that we can take their advice and counsel and help Americans get back to work. I believe that the best way to grow our economy is by nurturing an environment where a organic job growth is possible, and there's nothing more organic than in home, multi-housing, and single-family construction. According to the National Association of Manufacturers, U.S. manufacturing jobs pay around $77,000 a year, and we must find ways to facilitate growth in these domestic industries. And I hope today, uh, as we hear from the home building industry, we can help create the organic environment they need to stay competitive and create good paying jobs, all while building affordable housing for Americans. This is not a partisan issue. Uh, not only will we create this environment, foster job creation, but it'll also help our manufacturers build the next generation of energy efficient more affordable and safer homes. I want to thank again our witnesses for being here today. And Marcia, do you want a minute and a half? I'll yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling the hearing today. And I want to take my time and welcome Kurt Stevens, who is the CEO of Louisiana Pacific Corporation. It is headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. And we are proud to have it there. LP is not only one of the true backbones of the housing industry, but they are a leader 
in quality engineered wood building products, including OSB, structural framing products, and exterior siding for use in residential, industrial, and light commercial construction. As we talk about jobs in this committee, it's important to note that they employ 3,900 people and operate 25 mills located in the U.S., Canada, Chile, and Brazil. LP is striving not only to be seen as a respected manufacturer of building products, but is creating jobs in local communities across the country. These are family forest owners, truckers, loggers, suppliers, and we want to make certain that we keep that jobs growth environment in place. So, Mr. Stevens, we welcome you. I look forward to your testimony. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and all time I'll yield back the eight seconds and uh, recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, our ranking member, Jan Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank minutes. you for yielding and for holding today's very important hearing on the whole home building industry. In Chicago, where I'm from, home sale prices dropped dramatically following the Great Recession, 36% below pre-recession level. Housing in Chicago is rebounding from that low point. The median sale price for homes is 18% higher than last year, according uh, to Trulia. However, the, the New York Times Magazine this, this past weekend highlighted for many areas of Chicago, the foreclosure crisis is still causing pain and we need to develop policies to support the rehabilitation of those neighborhoods. The home building industry has historically been a good indicator of the strength of our economy, and I am pleased that the industry continues to recover from the recession. The industry supports almost 600,000 jobs nationwide, and with housing start, startups up, uh, uh, starts up 13% thir over the same period last year, I'm hopeful that those job numbers are going to continue to grow. As we seek ways to foster growth in the home building industry, it's important that we do so in a thoughtful and forward-looking way. The topic of energy and efficiency will be a major subject of today's hearing, and for good reason. Energy is one of the three largest costs of home ownership. Incentivizing upfront investments in energy-efficient building materials, electronics, and other products can save families thousands of dollars in the long run while also reducing pollution and improving public health. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how to motivate those investments in the development phase for new homes. And while we're on the subject of smart home design, I want to mention another important priority for me as it uh, uh, comes to housing. As we continue our housing recovery and our population ages and our military veterans return from the battlefield with severe physical disabilities, there is an increased need for accessible housing. The cost to renovate existing housing to make it accessible for those with physical disabilities can be tens of thousands of dollars, often forcing residents to move or become increasingly isolated or go to a nursing home. But if accessibility features are incorporated into housing at the time of construction, the additional cost can be less than $600. So next week, I plan to reintroduce the Inclusive Home Design Act, legislation I have sponsored for more than a decade, really at the behest of the disability community. Um, my bill would require homes built with federal dollars to meet inclusive design standards including at least one accessible or zero-step entrance into the home, doorways wide enough for a wheelchair on the main level. Let's face it, there's no magic to the size of a, of a door width if you do it initially as opposed to having to, to rehab it. One wheelchair accessible bathroom, light switches and thermostats at reachable heights from a wheelchair. Um, this legislation is a common sense approach to addressing the rising demand for inclusive housing. It is another case in which a low cost investment early 
can prevent incredibly burdensome renovations later on. I have to tell you, I have uh, made attempts in the past to deal with the home building industry. I hope that we can, some of us, have a conversation about this and that you'd consider support for this common sense legislation. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the state of home building, its impact on the overall economy, the increase in energy efficient home design, and how we can incentivize further job growth in the industry. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chair, and I am thrilled to introduce the president of the Texas Association of Builders and the president and CEO of Tilson Homes and my friend, Eddie Martin. Eddie has a distinction that I'll never have. He is a native Texan, born in Pecos, Texas. He's a West, West Texas man got his bachelor's degree from Abilene Christian University, his law degree from the University of Houston, and uh, Eddie's wife, Brenda, had been married for 33 years. And last September, Eddie and Brenda took on another full-time job, spoiling their first grandchild, Kate. So welcome, Eddie, thank you for coming. Look forward to your testimony. I yield back. Is there anybody else that wishes to be recognized for a statement? Oh, that's, uh, well, we have the five minutes. Okay, any, well, seeing none, your side, uh, anyone on your side? All right. This should be written down in congressional history as the shortest opening statements. <laughs> With that, we will start our testimony. As I mentioned, uh, we're going to go from Mr. Judson to our right. Uh, at five minutes, if you're still talking, you will hear some... Uh, progressively strengthening in sound tapping by the gavel. Uh, there's also some lights there, green, uh, yellow is the last minute, so you should start when you see it turn uh, yellow, uh, start wrapping up. So Mr. Judson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Very good, thank you. On behalf of more than 140,000 members of the National Association of Home Builders, I appreciate the opportunity to testify with you today. My name is Rick Judson. I'm a home builder and developer from Charlotte, North Carolina, and the chairman of the board of the National Association of Home Builders. Home building is dominated by small firms, and our membership reflects just that. Approximately 70% of the NHB members build 10 or fewer homes per year, and their median revenue is under a million dollars. Collectively, however, we represent a massive industry employing literally millions of people and producing about 17% of the nation's gross domestic product. The recession, of course, has uh, taken its heavy toll. Our total employment in home building is down almost 40% from our peak of 2006, and it's down to under 2.1 million employees. Last year, the industry only constructed 534,000 homes. For comparison, to keep up with population growth and replacement needs, we should be building about 1.4 million homes per year. There is, however, reason for optimism. Over the last two years, the housing market has started to heal, and home building is beginning to pick up. Our growth creates jobs, something you've all acknowledged. More than three full-time jobs are generated by the construction of each single-family home. Similarly, 100 new multifamily units will result in 116 new jobs. With just a normal production cycle, two million more job opportunities will be available to this country. Housing also provides a key tax base for state and local governments. Homeowners paid approximately $3 billion in property taxes last year. However, economic and policy headwinds are beginning to slow some recovery. For example, in response to the prolonged downturn, many building material companies cut back on production and capacity. Now that housing is coming back, the lack of product availability is resulting in rising costs. Pricing for lumber, wood products, uh, accounts for about 15% of the cost in new construction. OSB products have jumped over 80% in the past year. Framing lumber is up 32%. Gypsum products drywall, et cetera, are up about 40%. This drives up a new price for homes, which particularly 
uh, is tough on builders of affordable housing. It doesn't take much of an effect uh, to put people out of the ability to purchase a home. About 240,000 households will be priced out with every $1,000 increment in the cost of housing. Policies that streamline permitting, uh, that attract investment into domestic mining, that encourage multi-use forest management would all help in the pricing pressures that seem to ride this cyclical ride. We're also concerned with the trends in the energy code development to mandate certain or almost proprietary products or techniques. This significantly limits the choice for consumers and does not allow for the performance-driven value engineering that we would prefer. Further efforts to push energy efficiency without real consideration of cost is a huge problem. I'm a certified green professional builder and I understand the value of energy efficiency and its importance to the consumer. But even with those savings, there are significant upfront costs to be incurred into the home. We're particularly concerned about the costs imposed in one of the most recent energy codes. It will take the typical homeowner about 13 years to break even on that investment. In some states, like Nebraska, it would be almost 17 years. Traditionally, the consumer is expecting and willing to pay for that capital investment that would be recovered in seven or eight years. So to keep that in mind. These long payback periods will ultimately hurt housing affordability and ironically push lower income owners into cheaper, older, less efficient homes. Possibly the most significant uh, problem facing our industry is the lack of construction lending. Uh, NHB strongly supports two uh, bills, House Resolution 1255 and Senate Resolution 1002, that would require banking regulators to issue new guidance specifically addressing the key regulatory areas that have significantly hampered the flow of credit to our nation's home builders. There still is work to be done before we see a healthy housing market, but again, as I mentioned, there's reason to be optimistic. We have 2.1 million households that have not formed due to the economy. These are college students moving back in with their parents, like mine. There are people taking on extra roommates. Uh, these individuals represent significant demand in the near term and for both rental and uh, purchasing of homes. Forecasts predict that housing starts over the next year will nearly double that of 2009. Future growth, if not impeded by the issues I've discussed, will create jobs, will enhance small business, will create tax incentives and local, for, for local and federal governments. We're an industry that's ready to get back to work, and we would appreciate your assistance in assuring the recovery and our ability to contribute to society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Judson. Now, Mr. Stevens, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. My name is Kurt Stevens. I'm the CEO of Louisiana Pacific Corporation. This year, Louisiana Pacific celebrates our 40th anniversary. Over the years, we have managed millions of acres of forest land, operated hundreds of wood products mills, and sold almost every building product that can be made from wood. A little more than a decade ago, we sold our forest lands and narrowed our focus to concentrate on what we do best, manufacturing and selling building products. Today, we produce the wood products that build the roofs, walls, and floors of single and multifamily homes across the country. More than half of LP sales come from products made in 15 manufacturing sites spread across 13 states, from Northern California to Maine to Alabama. We are headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, and also operate administrative sites in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. We operate another 10 plants in Canada, Chile, and Brazil. LP employs 2,630 people in the United States. 2,200 of these folks are in our production facilities located in rural areas close to our wood supply. These are communities where jobs can be scarce and LP is often the major employer. Besides these LP jobs, for every person LP directly employs, about three additional jobs are created in these communities for loggers, truckers, suppliers, and others. In addition, LP provides income to thousands of local family forest owners by purchasing the timber that they grow. Even during the market recession, the wood products industry operated almost 1,000 manufacturing facilities across America, providing close to 400,000 jobs and a payroll of $16.5 billion, and this was in 2011. Over the years, LP has been through many up and down cycles in the housing market. 
but we have never seen a dip as severe as the recent housing downturn from 2007 to 2012. LP, along with others in our industry, was forced to shutter mills, reduce hours and shifts, and lay off workers. The good news is that the last year housing starts are slowly but consistently improving. We are cautiously optimistic about the next few years. The signs of continued growth are there, but we still face economic headwinds and regulatory burdens that could slow growth in income and jobs. It is in this context that I would like to offer perspectives on several priorities to ensure that this fundamental American industry continues to strengthen and remain competitive. Environmental stewardship and compliance is one of LP's core values, and the woods products industry has met many costly regulatory challenges over the years. The industry needs a reasonable and sustainable regulatory path based in quality science. For example, the Wood Maximum Achievable Control Technology, or MACT, will cost LP upwards of $13 million. The wood products industry is a leading user of wood fiber and producer and user of carbon neutral renewable biomass energy to run our plants. Mandates and incentives, including the federal renewable electricity standard, climate policies, and the renewable fuel standard promote the use of biomass for energy. Policymakers should be mindful of the growing demand that this has created in the U.S. and internationally for biomass and the impact it could have on the mature wood products industry that rely on this fiber both as our raw material and a means for energy creation at our facilities. Additionally, wood products face a threat from the U.S. Department of Energy supported 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. Despite the ability of either product to contribute to equivalent thermal performance, the 2012 version of the IECC unjustifiably gives preferential treatment to one product foam sheathing over structural wood panels such as OSB. That preference could result in a loss of 20 percent of the structural wood market and thousands of jobs. As an international company, comprehensive tax reform, though not easy, is long overdue. At LP, these are real issues that affect daily decisions about where we make our products and hire our people. For example, Canada is one of many OECD member countries that have lowered corporate rates during the past two decades while U.S. corporate rates have remained nearly stagnant. Finally, LP supports immigration reform that helps ensure that we can find qualified labor to operate our mills, plant trees for sustainable forests that supply our raw materials, and to construct the homes our products help to make. In summary, Louisiana Pacific and the woods products industry play an important role in the economy of our nation and the building of America. We are on the upswing, but we need your help in enacting and supporting policies to ensure that we have reasonable science-based environmental regulation, energy regulations and codes that maintain a level playing field and fair competition, corporate tax reform, and policies to address labor needs and skills gaps. We are proud to manufacture the materials that literally build America. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you at this hearing. Thank you. Well done. And now, uh Mr. George Kubot, who is the president and CEO of Phillips Manufacturing, headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. You are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Terry, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is George Kubot, and I am the president and CEO of Phillips Manufacturing Company. Phillips is a drywall bead and trim manufacturer, the metal corners used in drywall applications and related products. We are a nationwide manufacturer and distribution company, employee owned and in business for over 50 years. Given my limited time in front of the subcommittee this morning, I will be focused on the following areas and request your help, which will benefit many manufacturers in the United States. One, over-regulation. Two, vocational education. Three, taxation. And four, unfair foreign competition. Overregulation. My initial comment is the general concern that any time a representative of a government agency contacts a business and says, I am from the government and I am here to help you, the immediate reaction is for the business to assume a defensive position. The growth and complexity of regulation and corresponding enforcement increases in all areas every year. Although the agencies may know the regulations and rules under their umbrella, it is impossible for small manufacturers to stay current with what they must comply. Of course, lack of knowledge or understanding is not a defense for noncompliance. 
There are 13 federal agencies whose regulatory umbrella Phillips Manufacturing must comply with. They are listed in my prepared comments. Certainly, there is a need for regulation and governance over manufacturing practices for many reasons, including employee safety, quality of treatment, environment, immigration, health care, taxes, and many more. But it can't possibly make sense for <clears throat> a relatively simple metal manufacturing business like Phillips to work through 13 federal agencies and dozens of state and local agencies. <clears throat> as difficult and as expensive as compliance is for Phillips, it has to be impossible for the smallest of manufacturers, those with 50 or less employees. Over the past several decades in the United States, we have created a labyrinth bureaucracy of government policy and complexity of regulation that makes it difficult for Phillips manufacturing and especially small manufacturers to comply with today's requirements. Vocational education. Another request for this sub subcommittee is to reverse the decline in vocational education. Phillips manufacturing is not alone in the struggle to find enough workers to fill our positions in the skilled trades. I believe many manufacturers and our customers in the building construction trades share the same challenge. It is a little wonder that we struggle to find enough people in the skilled trades when I reflect on the fact, to my knowledge, high schools, community colleges have none or minimal shop type classes. The local community colleges have switched their marketing focus from skilled trades education <clears throat> to university preparation. Compare this situation to when I was in school where almost every high school had shop classes and the local community colleges focused on skilled trade education. Taxation. <clears throat> the U.S. tax code is archaic, complex, and beyond the ability of even the IRS to understand it. Tax rates only continue to increase, including the tax increases mandated by the Health Care and Educational Reconciliation Act of 2010, which, by the way, it seems no one really understands how this act will fully impact our cost of doing business in the United States. One thing is clear, income tax rates for the smaller businesses, which are fortunate enough to make money, will go up by 3.8% in 2013. In addition, payroll taxes will increase, as well as the cost of providing insurance benefits to our employees. These costs reduce our ability to reinvest in our businesses and be competitive with nine U.S. businesses. Unfair foreign competition. Earlier, I referred to the global economy. What do we view as unfair competition? Our regulatory and tax structure in the United States creates a higher cost of production for many products which Phillips manufactures. The unfair foreign competition is from products manufactured in countries where governments provide financial support. These products are of inferior material and quality. China is a major concern, also there are other countries. It makes it difficult not only to compete with these products for sales in the United States, it makes it impossible to ever think of exporting any of our products to foreign countries. Phillips Manufacturing only manufactures in the United States. In conclusion, please take action to lower taxes. Stop the bureaucratic growth of regulation. Less is better. Skilled trades are good jobs, and people need to be trained and educated to fill these positions. Create and address unfair foreign competition. Phillips is very proud to label all of our products made in the USA. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you, Mr. Kubat. And Mr. Martin is the president and CEO of Tilson Home Corporation. That we heard uh, somebody up on this dial brag about. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman uh, Lee Terry and Ranking Member Schakowsky and the members of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Manufacturing, and Trade, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eddie Martin, and I am a home builder from Texas and President and CEO of Tilson Home Corporation. I have 30 years of experience in the building industry myself, both as a practitioner and an industry representative. I am honored to participate in this hearing on the housing role in sustaining and growing the national economy. Established in 1932, Tilson designs and builds custom homes on customers' property throughout Texas. We are a family owned and operated. Now for four generations, family members have managed our business. We are ranked by Builder Magazine as one of the 100 largest builders in the United States. We have seen firsthand that the housing market has improved over the last year, which is a welcome change to our industry and the economy. The building industry includes a vast network that includes general contractors and some contracted businesses, some of who will testify here today. 
At the same time, this turnaround presents new challenges for the industry. At Tilson Homes, we are already experiencing labor shortage in both high skill and low skill ends of the construction labor categories. The most acute shortages are framing, flooring, roofing, HVAC, plumbing, and electrical contractors. My company has experienced delays due to the lack of qualified frame or cr framing crews who are familiar with various structural building codes, including windstorm codes on the coast. Plumbers and HVAC technicians are in short supply. We are struggling to find master plumbers and roughing crews which run the pipes and foundations before the concrete is placed. Because the workforce is aging, it is getting harder to find young plumbers to enter the trade. As a 100% committed EPA Energy Star builder, Tilson is required to use Energy Star certified HVAC contractors. Finding new certified HVAC contractors is difficult, difficult because of the shortage of skilled workers trained in Energy Star. As a result of the shortage of skilled labor, on, averages, on average it is taking my company a month longer to build our homes which adds to our costs and makes it more difficult to satisfy our customers. As a state and national industry rep, I can attest the lack of skilled labor has become a nationwide problem. In the most recent NAHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index survey, 46% of builders experienced delays in completing projects on time. 15% of the respondents had to turn down some projects and another 9% lost or canceled sales as a result of the recent labor shortages. According to the 2011 American Community Survey, foreign-born foreign workers account for 22% of the construction labor force nationally. This number varies by state, and in some states, such as Texas, they, we have nearly 40% foreign-born workers in the industry. These are the states that will experience the most acute labor shortages once home building increases. I would also note that the immigrants that con are concentrated in some trades needed to build homes, such as carpenters, painters, drywall, brick, brick masons, and general construction laborers. These are the trades that require less training and education, but consistently register the highest labor shortages in NHB surveys. As Congress begins to consider immigration reform, I strongly believe that it, this is an important opportunity for the country to implement a new market-based visa system that would allow more immigrants to legally enter the construction workforce each year. Despite our efforts to recruit and train American workers, there is still a worker shortage, which is a very real obstacle to our industry's full recovery as work is delayed or canceled due to this shortage. The housing industry is turning the corner and contributing to an improving labor market. However, I believe a long-term holistic approach to comprehensive immigration reform can maximize the recovery in housing and allow the industry to reach its full economic potential. Thank you for having me. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. And now we recognize uh, Mr. Bazzuto from uh, the National Apartments Association. Uh, he is the chairman and CEO of Bazuto Group. And I thank you for uh, taking the time to come to us. And you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Terry and Ranking Member Schakowsky, representing the National Multi Housing Council and the National Apartment Association, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to testify the multifamily sector to the sector's contribution to the national economy. I am Tom Bazzuto, Chairman and CEO of the Bazzuto Group and also Chairman of the National Multi-Housing Council. I have been in the multifamily business for more than four decades. My firm focuses on the Mid-Atlantic region, developing, building, and managing apartment properties. In our country, the strongest communities contain a mix of housing options, and that includes apartments. Apartment homes and our 35 million residents nationally contribute $1.1 trillion annually to the economy and help support more than 25 million jobs. I'm proud to say that since the recession in 2009, my company, the Bazzuto Group, has developed, is building, 
more than three quarters of a billion dollars worth of projects that have collectively supported more than 10,000 jobs. Nationally, research by George Mason University economist Steve Fuller shows that in 2011 alone, apartment construction, reflecting approximately one-third of all new housing starts, had a total economic contribution of $42.5 billion and supported nearly 324,000 jobs, including 121,000 on-site positions. Furthermore, half of all households formed, new households formed this decade are expected to rent, so demand will continue to grow. Supply is already falling short, as an estimated three to 400,000 units must be built each year to meet demand. Yet just half that number was delivered in 2012. It's important to realize that the multifamily industry relies heavily on our manufacturing partners to both develop new apartments and maintain the country's 19 million apartment homes. Allow me to illustrate this with one of my own projects, Union Wharf. We are building this $72 million apartment community in Baltimore's historic Fells Point neighborhood. And when completed later this year, it will provide 281 apartment homes and 4,500 square feet of retail. More than 600 jobs will have been created by this track, uh, by this project. On track to achieve LEED Gold certification and build on a f infill former industrial lot, the project showcases our commitment to sustainability and demonstrates how apartments spur economic growth. The manufacturing impact of this project is profound. The building required enough concrete to fill 240 swimming pools. End to end, the lumber used would span about 331 miles, and the drywall could cover more than 42 football fields. The, the sprinkler system alone required 56,000 linear feet of piping and almost 5,000 heads. In addition, we will use 204,000 pounds of granite, 290,000 bricks, more than 7,000 gallons of paint, and 1,700 appliances, and 3,500 cabinets, and this is one building. A significant percentage of these materials were manufactured in America, with more than 25% coming from within 500 miles of the site. The apartment in industry, as demonstrated by this one project, is a robust economic engine that provides lasting job growth and spending nationwide. And now for our recommendations. As significant consumers of energy, policies that ensure continued access to affordable fuel sources are critical. Efficiency improvements made in apartment properties can generate significant energy reductions and can impact a large number of households. The committee should advance incentive-based strategies for promoting building efficiency that recognize the, US, the unique characteristics of apartments. We also cre uh, caution against creating a rating system that grades of buildings on their energy efficiency. And instead, we support the expansion of well-known energy management tools to apartments such as the Energy Star Program. We also support voluntary green building programs such as the National Green Building Standard, the only standard, the only uh, standard written to be seamlessly incorporated into existing building codes. My written testimony also outlines several other key issues critical to the apartment industry, such as a tax system that promotes economic growth without disrupting the real estate industry, a housing finance system that provides access to capital in all markets at all times, and a regulatory environment that does not inhibit our ability to provide housing to millions of American people. On behalf of the apartment industry, thank you for the opportunity to testify. And thank you. And now, uh, speaking of home energy uh, efficiencies, uh, we have Mr. Nadell, who's the Executive Director of the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. Thank you for being here, and you are now recognized for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Chairman Ter Terry, other members of the committee. I'm very happy to speak uh, before you today. As you noted, I'm the Executive Director of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. We're a nonprofit organization that acts as a catalyst to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, and investments. We were formed by energy researchers and just celebrated our 33rd anniversary. Personally, I've been involved in energy efficiency issues since the 1970s. 
ACEEE is a nonpartisan organization. In our view, energy efficiency is a quintessentially nonpartisan issue, since no one is in favor of energy waste. Today's hearing is on home building and home economics. A critical part of home economics is making homes energy efficient so they have low operating costs. The major costs of home ownership are mortgage payments, property taxes, home insurance, and energy. The mortgage industry commonly refers to PITI for principal interest taxes and insurance. But energy costs should also be included as they are usually higher than insurance costs and sometimes higher than taxes. In my written testimony, I provide some average numbers. Uh, specifically, mortgages average more than $12,000 per year for the average home. Real estate taxes and energy each uh, average just over $2,000 per year, and insurance is about $800 per year. While energy costs average just over $2,000 per year, some homes use more than twice that amount, and others use less than half this amount. In most homes, energy use and energy bills can be reduced by 20 to 40 percent through cost-effective energy efficiency investments. In my written testimony, I show how energy efficiency investments in our homes cost less than new electricity supplies and often less than current natural gas prices. In addition to saving energy, another virtue of energy efficiency investments are that they tend to be very labor intensive, helping to create jobs. Unfortunately, a variety of market barriers keeps builders, homeowners, landlords, and renters from realizing these savings. The barriers are many fold and include such factors as split incentives, panic purchases, <coughs> and bundling of energy saving features with extra high cost uh, bells and whistles. Uh, the term split incentives refers to the fact that landlords and builders often do not make efficiency investments because the benefits of lower energy bills are received by tenants and uh, home buyers. In the United States, policies to improve the energy efficiency of homes, both new and existing, are primarily at the state and local levels. However, federal policy has had an impact, and at a minimum, the federal government can provide information and assistance in order to make it easier for states and local jurisdictions to undertake appropriate local actions. I discussed several current policies in my written testimony, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to note that only about 11 percent of new homes qualify for the current federal new homes tax incentive. The other 89 percent uh, could do better, and that about uh, the Home Performance with Energy Star program, the leading home retrofit program, has retrofitted less than 1 percent of the single-family housing stock and even less of the multifamily stock. Reaching more homes with these and similar programs will help reduce energy costs and improve affordability for many homeowners. Overall, the National Academy of Sciences in, 19, in 2010 found that energy efficiency could reduce U.S. energy use by 25 to 30 percent below forecasted levels. Recently, Representatives McKinney and Welch, both members of the subcommittee, introduced the Energy Savings and Industrial Competitiveness Act, H.R. 1616, which is a bipartisan bill that includes multiple provisions to encourage energy efficiency. This is a companion uh, to uh, similar legislation introduced by Senators uh, Shaheen and Portman. Uh, the Senate bill was recently reported out of committee on a bipartisan 19 to 3 vote expected to reach the Senate floor in July. Uh, we hope that the uh, um, H.R. 1616 could follow in its wake. Um, in this bill, as well as a number of other bills uh, that have been uh, introduced um, or that uh, amendments are expected uh, uh, on the Senate floor, there are four uh, specific policy recommendations I wanted to briefly uh, mention here. Uh, first, uh, support for model and state building codes. These codes are developed by groups like the International Code Council. Uh, DOE provides technical assistance to these bodies and also assists states that are considering adopting them. Uh, H.R. 1616 makes the code revision process more transparent and encourages and assists states to consider the most recent uh, model codes and to improve compliance with the codes. Uh, we recommend that this be included. I would note that decision making remains at the state level. Uh, second, I would note that improving home mortgage underwriting. Most mortgage underwriting decisions are made based on mortgage payments, taxes, and insurance, but not energy costs. Investments in energy efficiency can reduce the carrying cost of a home, improving loan payment rates, potentially qualifying more purchasers for mortgages. A recent study by uh, researchers at the University of North Carolina found that efficient homes, meaning uh, those certified to meet Energy Star criteria, had a 32 percent lower default rate than otherwise similar homes. In the 112th Congress, Senators um, Bennett and Isaacson introduced uh, a bill called the SAVE Act. It's now going through uh, revisions, and I understand it may be reintroduced soon. 
Our understanding is that the revised bill is likely to direct HUD to develop guidelines for considering expected energy cost savings of a property when determining home uh, loan eligibility and also for uh, determining home value determinations. And in addition, it would encourage efforts to inform loan applicants of the costs and benefits of improving the energy efficiency of their homes. These changes will make homes uh, more efficient, um, more valuable and affordable by reducing home energy bills. I also discuss ways to improve home energy benchmarking and how to enact temporary incentives for comprehensive home energy retrofits. I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Well, and thank you. And now we go into the Q&A uh, phase of our hearing. We get to ask the questions and you get to answer. Uh, this is the fun part. Uh, so, Mr. Kubat, I'll start with you. Uh, will you describe for us the difference from uh, number of employees that you've employed to make the one part, uh, the drywall beads, from, let's say, 2008 to current? Well, maybe just as a quick overview that uh, I'm old enough that I've had several lives, and it was in 2008 was the first time that I ever had to lay off people uh, from positions where I wanted to keep them. Uh, we cannot control construction starts, and we've heard from several of the speakers today uh, the pain that the construction industry uh, went through that related to uh, housing of any type, whether it's single, multi-apartment, uh, uh, condominium, that uh, the cliff was very steep, and what we thought was a correction or a, a valley was a canyon. So back in 2007, before the collapse, our total employment would have been in the high 200s. Uh, we've heard statistics where up to 40% uh, of people, I believe uh, Mr. Stevens indicated, uh, Louisiana Pacific had a uh, closing of plants and downturns. We, fortunately, we did not have to close any plants. Uh, that we have three plants. Uh, but we did have significant reduction in employment. And I can't give you the exact number, but certainly it was down significantly under uh, 200, maybe 160, 170 people. We are now uh, back with what I refer to as the rising tide, and certainly we have an improving construction market. Hopefully we can continue to support it in the United States. Uh, we are continuing to hire, uh, but one of the challenges that we have uh, is this area of what uh, are called skilled workers, and I'm going to say that's primarily tool and die shop, and the, uh, the training for that has to be on site. There is not educational and vocational training uh, bringing these people into the uh, manufacturing market. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to give us support in that well, area as we look to hire more people. Appreciate that. So let me feed off of the uh, aspect, because it's amazing of all the different hearings we've had, everyone has testified that they have job openings in the manufacturing and building area, but lack the semi-skilled and skilled workers necessary. So, Mr. Judson, and I'll just go down the line, if you could be fairly quick, do you have any thoughts on, on where we should focus our efforts to try and develop the uh, semi-skilled and skilled workers necessary? <clears throat> from, from two fronts, the, the technical training is important. It's been something that has been de-emphasized over the past few years. People have left our industry to go into other trades. There, there just was not the demand for their services, so they've gone into other trades. The, the deglamorization of the construction trade has caused people in high school, for example, not to go into the, the trade arena. So they're not learning a trade. Uh, the, the immigration laws at this point are uh, prohibitive in allowing us to hire trainees, as it might be, to fill some of those um, beginning entry slots. So I would say to answer your question, uh, a focus on technical training uh, with trade schools and a focus on uh, directing immigrant labor opportunities into the industry. All right. Mr. Stevens? I would second what was said there. The only thing that, that I might add uh, to that is that the immigration reform will help both the direct labor workers as well as the skilled laborers. Canada is an interesting example. Canada just basically waived their immigration requirements for skilled trades and they're bringing in a lot of individuals from the Philippines and from Ireland to fill these skill needs and that may be a model you might want to consider looking at. Mr. Martin? 
Yeah, I would echo uh, Mr. Judson's comments, but I'd also, you know, one of the problems uh, is that the high schools have no vocational training. In Texas, when they went to the 4x4 program, which is required four years of science, English, social studies, and math, it took out vocational training. And so there is no vocational training in Texas anymore, and there, there's actually a bill on the governor's desk to reinstitute vocational training in the high schools. And I think that would start getting people, young high school uh, men and women who are not willing to go to college or wanting to go to college to get into a trade. Yeah, very interesting. Mr. Mazzuto? Uh, the, the apartment industry began to recover from the recession before the home building industry did. And we began to see this shortage of manpower sooner. And, and, and it is very severe, and it is causing uh, meaningful cost increases. They, they, I defer to my associates here and their comment about vocational education and, and, uh, and agree with them. With respect to immigration reform, our industry, our associations clearly support comprehensive immigration um, reform at the federal level with a reliable um, system for the employers to verify um, uh, credentials. Okay. Thank you very much, and Mr. Nadell, you don't get to answer that question, but I have a feeling you'll be asked a lot of questions. And that brings me to Mr. Matheson. Sorry, I'm yanking it back. All right, no problem. I was just ready to pinch the it. The ranking member is now recognized for her five minutes. I apologize. When family calls, you worry and take the call. So I apologize. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about foreclosures. Um, it, it's been a, uh, a, a real problem and continues to be, as I mentioned in my testimony in, in Chicago. Um, an average family who simply lives in proximity to foreclosures and who may not have any trouble with their own loans um, have already lost or will lose more than $20,000 in, in household wealth. Um, it's also uh, become clear that many of those companies that carried out foreclosures over the last few years kept poor documentation, sometimes employed abusive tactics, in some cases committed outright fraud. Um, on May 16th, Representative Cummings introduced H.R. 1706, the Mortgage Settlement Monitoring Act of 2013. Um, and uh, I, I, along with the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Waxman, our original co-sponsors, to try and ensure transparency in a federal settlement on mortgage servicers, unsafe and unsound uh, practices. And a few members of this committee are uh, co-sponsors. So Mr. Judson, the National Association of Home Builders states on its website that it, quote, urges banks to engage in transparent and effective forms of communication with borrowers to avoid unnecessary financial distress, unquote. It seems like it would be in the best interest of home builders and homeowners alike to reduce residential mortgage servicing and processing abuses, as well as to promote transparency in any federal reviews. So I was uh, I wanted to ask you, you may need to get more information, but on the surface, does this sound like a bill um, that could be supported? Sorry. I think the, con <clears throat> pardon me, the concept of what you're proposing is certainly supportable. Our industry doesn't deal in the, uh, the writing or underwriting of mortgages. We, we build the homes that unfortunately have been foreclosed upon. Uh, we support that settlement. We support a, a fair settlement, the guilt associated with the foreclosure process is multifaceted, whether it be improper underwriting, whether it be greed, whether it be um, uh, people being truly misled on what their payments and obligation would be. It's across the board. We, we want that settlement done. We want it completed. Uh, these people need housing. I mean, if you can look at the, the housing stock in this country, the people are being displaced or having to rent, and in some cases, for more money than they could refinance their current home for if they're paying a, a normal regular rate so we support that settlement 
Thank you. Um, we'd like to, you to take a look at, and we'll get that to you, the, the legislation itself. And hopefully, um, if we had the uh, support of the home builders, that would be a, a, a boost for it. That's 1706. It's, that's correct. Thank you. Yeah, 1706. Um, I also wanted to, to talk about energy uh, efficient appliances, uh, Mr. Nadal. Um, I think you, you mentioned that various uh, state and local, but also federal level energy efficiency standards have come into effect. Residential and commercial appliances have evolved into high performance machines, um, et cetera. But meanwhile, the price of energy efficient appliances is falling. Um, a new report by um, the ACEEE found that between 1987 and 2010, real prices of refrigerators, washers, dishwashers decreased by 35 percent, 45 percent, and 30 percent, respectively. So I'd like to ask you about this report and your other work on appliances, and can we conclude that state and federal energy efficiency standards for appliances are a highly effective, highly beneficial force for consumers and the environment. And if I get a new air conditioner that we're looking at, is that going to? Am I going to get the help I need in terms of some sort of a credit? Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, our recent report did find that for many, most of the uh, home appliances as well as commercial products that are regulated under federal standards. Prices have been actually declining. Manufacturers have sharpened their pencils and figured out ways to reduce the cost, even as they've dramatically improved energy efficiency. Energy savings are quite large as well. And the very interesting thing from that uh, report is we found that consumer choice had actually either stayed the same or increased. The products were better today, had more features, uh, better performance than before. So I do think that that program has been very successful in saving energy, saving money. Uh, the program has been very careful to set those standards at levels that are cost effective and technolo technologically feasible. So yes, that is very good. In terms of your question about uh, air conditioners, uh, I don't, um, assuming you're in Chicago, I know uh, ComEd has a number of incentive programs that might be very useful to help you go beyond the minimum standard. For air conditioners, the minimum standard is called the SEER rating of 13, but uh, in many climates, 15, 16 uh, might make sense. <laughs> Thank you. Gentlelady yields back at this time. Will uh, re chair recognizes uh, vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn, for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Nadell, I want to stay with you on the energy efficiency issue. I have to tell you, I have never met anybody that wants to pay more <laughs> for their energy cost. Everyone is looking for a, a way to cut those costs. And I, I keep watching these DOE and EPA mandates and the way they apply the rules you know, how they'll take the laws and then they go about different things through uh, rulemaking. And of course, where I'm from down in Tennessee, and I'm sure Mr. Stevens will tell you, a lot of us down there like to have a ceiling fan in the kitchen or the bedroom or out on the back porch if it's a, a covered porch. So has your organization taken a position on the DOE regulatory framework on ceiling fans? Um, in general, as I re replied to uh, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, uh, we do support the efficiency standards program and particularly making sure that any new standards are technologically feasible and economically justified. On ceiling fans, uh, that provision, as I recall, was enacted by Congress in 2005 as based That's correct. on it's part consensus. Of the um, and yes, we supported that uh, standard, and I believe that they are now reviewing that standard and trying to decide what, if any, changes may make sense. So we will plan to participate in that process. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think DOE should be in the business of mandating the efficient products, or should they allow consumers the choice of choosing energy-saving products that are going to fit their needs? Right. The minimum standards remove the least efficient products from the market. They help address some of the market barriers, but then give consumers many, many choices. As I mentioned before, they tend to actually improve consumer choice rather than decrease consumer choice. Well, and see, I think that we should be encouraging 
consumers uh, and doing things to open up that environment and not making it more expensive and more difficult. Um, ceiling fans are one of those things that are in the market that can help people reduce their energy use. And sometimes I look at this and I think that burdening the ceiling man ceiling fan manufacturers with increased regulations prices a lot of people out of that market and then increases their reliance on cooling systems. Am I wrong about that? Um, we did not specifically look at ceiling fans, but for many of the products, the prices have actually declined with standards, uh, not increased. So if we can have a win-win, I think it is worthwhile. But again, we have not specifically looked at ceiling fans. Well, see, and we need more win-wins. We need less regulation and more options and uh, the ability of individuals to get into that marketplace. Mr. Stevens, I want to come to you. Mr. Judson, sitting over there next to you, mentioned that there had been a number of news articles about rising building material prices. And he also mentioned that there have been recent declines in wood prices and that this has been a positive development. So is this a trend we can expect to continue going forward? And can you confirm that this is the result of expanded production based on confidence that the recovery is real and justifies a return to higher levels of capacity and output. We, our building products that we produce are generally commodities. And a commodity product is, by its nature, is a decision between a supplier and a buyer on what that price will be. So let me just use Ornate Strand Board uh, as an example, or OSB. At the end of December, that price was $360 per thousand square feet, roughly. And the first quarter, it rose to 430 because there was more demand than there was immediate supply, and so buyers and sellers arrived at a higher price. In the last six, six weeks, that price has fallen below $300. So you see that there's a wide range of pricing in these commodity products, and that will continue. It will be local supply and demand considerations. It will be uh, production coming online or production <laughs> coming offline. It will also be very contingent upon weather and other conditions for building. So as you have both the demand and the supply side of that. I can speak directly to what LP has done. We made a decision in October to bring on a new plant in Alabama that we built for a cost of $240 million and ran it for six weeks. Then the housing market uh, declined and we shut that plant down for five years. Uh, that took us about nine months and over $10 million in capital to bring that plant online. We also announced last month that we're bringing on a plant in British Columbia to support the Western United States in building products. So we are bringing on capacity at our plants to meet what we expect to be continued demand for our building products. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will submit in writing a question for Mr. Martin that I had, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes now the gentleman from Utah. You're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Terry. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the witnesses being here today. Uh, Mr. Judson, I had a question for you um, about the issue of the home building industry's uh, challenges that it faces in the credit area, specifically for your uh, AD and C loans, your acquisition, development, construction loans. Could you please talk to me about how those loans are used and the challenges that your industry is facing with those loans? Pardon me, a builder will usually uh, apply to a lending institution to borrow funds to build a home for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, under the current climate and what has existed for the past several years, the builder cannot get that loan to build the home. Uh, even more difficult is the ability to get a what's called a speculative loan, where a builder would build a model home or a home for sale uh, waiting for the buyer to come along and buy the home. That is driven by the regulatory um, infighting that's taking place between the, the regulating agencies and the lending institutions themselves. Each blames the other person for it. Uh, the lenders say that the regulators are um, over-regulating and the regulators say that the banks are not properly underwriting their loans. So it's a catch-22, and caught in the middle is 
first the builder and secondly the homeowner who then can't get a home built. Now if by some miracle the builder can build the home then the difficulty lies in being able to get that home financed which includes the the uh, lender willing to make the loan properly underwritten which was not the case in the past. They were not properly underwritten, let's face it. Uh, loans today are properly underwritten. You can look at the GSEs, you can look at, at every single bank, they're making money because they're properly underwriting their loans. So it's important for us as um, builders to be able to have access to financing to be able to build the homes to house those people who want to buy the homes. And would you suggest there may be some role that Congress could play in trying to clarify this regulatory uncertainty that you were describing earlier? Yes, thank you. There, there were two bills that have been presented, one on the House side, one on the Senate side, that address the specificity of what a regulatory responsibility should be. It uh, clarifies some of the capital requirements that lenders should have and could have to make qualified loans to the consumer or the builder. But the, the congressional uh, responsibility, I think, lies in their ability to more directly engage the regulatory arena in what their real responsibilities and authorities are. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you mentioned in your testimony uh, the, the challenges of the government policies that are picking winners and losers, and you specifically mentioned uh, the, the renewable fuel standards mandate, mandate for biomass fuels is a policy that could hurt the long-term sustainability of forests. Can you uh, expand on that and explain how the RFS could hurt not only forest sustainability but also users of forest resources and products? It all, it all comes back to the, to the proposed subsidies for uh, renewable fuels. As an industry, for over 200 years, the forest products industry has used trees for their primary raw material and to produce the energy to run their plants. For our LP, an average OSB plant will produce 95% of the energy from the wood waste right. from our products. Right. What we want is a, just a level playing field. We don't want any subsidies. We want to play based on the economics of the use of that wood and to be fair across the board. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. It, uh, I'm out of order, but I have the gavel. It was interesting. Uh, we, a person that came to talk to me uh, talked about uh, in the wood business how they are producing solely to send woody biomass to Europe to meet their renewable standards. So it's not lumber that's being used in the United States, but being milled and sent overseas. thought that was interesting. Uh, we recognize the vice chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Uh, Lance, for your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you all. Uh, in my home state of New Jersey, uh, builders are reporting a surge in unit construction over last year's figures. I believe uh, 22,000 new units this year. This is good news. Uh, data released by the National Association of Realtors uh, show growth in the state's median residential real estate prices with multifamily uh, construction growing the fastest. Uh, this is a first since uh, the peak of the housing boom uh, roughly a decade ago. Of course, the market in New Jersey remains heavily affected by Hurricane Sandy and the lasting impact will be felt for quite some time as the shore region of our state continues to rebuild. The storm did, however, spur much needed uh, new construction and renovations, boosting the lumber, plumbing, and electric industries in these areas. Um, to uh, Mr. Judson, um, following up on uh, what you have stated previously, um, what do you think we can do best to untangle the tangle that exists between those who wish to build and the fact that there seems to be a reluctance on the part of uh, those who lend money to lend the appropriate amount of money. The, uh, before service on this committee, I did serve on the Financial Services Committee, and this is a continuing issue. And both on that committee and on this committee, we've had repeated testimony that 
banks are not lending appropriately. I've testified for that committee, as you probably know. Yes, and, sir. Uh, if I had the answers, I would have told you then. But, yes, sir. Uh, I'm learning <laughs> as this goes along. As are we. It, it, it's an unfolding issue. I, I would go back to the specificity and the clear underwriting requirements for lenders. The banks had a knee-jerk reaction. I think this whole uh, scenario was much of a knee-jerk because of the dilemma that started several years ago with, uh, with foreclosures and poorly underwritten loans. So it would start, I think, with a direction from Congress, financial services, to the, the regulatory environment of mm -hmm. working with lenders to support the home building industry, uh, uh, allowing them more latitude on the capitalization rates that they have. These have been the suggestions that are currently written in the law have been taken as mandates that you cannot go over certain limits whereas the community banks are now being literally put out of business from the construction lending standpoint of the regulation. Um, the community banks had absolutely nothing to do with the financial meltdown, as you, as you know better than I. Correct. They were good actors in this whole process. And um, from my perspective, they are scared to death by overregulation here in Washington, uh, especially after uh, the passage of Dodd-Frank, for which I certainly did not vote. Um, but, but be that as it may, we all want a better environment so that the American people can, can uh, purchase the new residential real estate, and there is a pent-up demand in my judgment. Um, uh, and, and we're discouraged because, because we feel that it's important for the progress of the economics of the nation that this occur. Uh, do you believe that we should revisit statutory law or simply uh, require uh, the agencies that administer current statutory law to do a better job? That's a good question. It's probably some of both. The, mm -hmm. the, the statutory guidelines uh, could be specifically identified to address some of the concerns. I keep going back to the capitalization, capitalization that yes. banks yes. have. Mm -hmm. um, but the the, the willingness, almost encouragement, we spoke with Mr. Bernanke a couple of times, and mm -hmm. his term of uh, the pendulum having swung too far, I think is an accurate yes, sir. term. Yes, sir. Yes, so, thank you. Thank you. Are there others on the panel who wish to address the issue I've raised? Hearing none, I uh, yield back the 40 seconds I have, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my daddy was a home builder, so I uh, appreciate the uh, work that you all do, and uh, I appreciate also how important home building is to our national economy, not only in terms of employment, but in terms of just giving people confidence in, uh, in the economy and, and their spending and so on. So thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for your passion. Um, I understand about 40% of our nation's energy is used by buildings. Of course, part of that is by commercial buildings, and part of that is by home buildings. But uh, uh, I'm very interested in energy efficiency housing, so I'd like to address my first question to Mr. Nadel. How much specialized training is required by uh, the workers uh, to produce uh, high efficiency, even net zero housing, as opposed to uh, what would be required in terms of the building materials to accomplish those goals? Um, it will vary depending on the technique employed, but generally it will require some extra training uh, in terms of a very careful installation, prevent air leakage and whatnot, how to install some of the new materials, but it's not dramatic. Uh, there are usually short training courses available to help people get certified in doing these types of techniques. How much does it cost, say, to build a net zero home compared to a standard home? I don't recall for a net zero home for or a or home, high efficiency home. Right, for a high efficiency home that uses half the energy of a typical uh, new home, the estimates range anywhere from one thousand to four, five thousand dollars, depending on the type of home and who does the estimate. But these are for homes that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, that sounds pretty like a pretty good bargain. Does anyone else care to address the, the question that I posed about uh, training requirements? This could be just a little bit different spin on it, uh, Congressman, but uh, a comment that maybe goes back a little bit to Ms. Blackburn, too, but I had talked about over-regulation and the difference in regulation. Uh, in our manufacturing plant, which is a little bit different than residential, 
there's an OSHA standard for air quality. Uh, in the state of Ohio, the Ohio EPA also has a standard for air quality, and I don't know if the o Ohio EPA standard is based off of a federal EPA standard, but it's significantly less than the OSHA EPA standard. So our plant more than meets the OSHA EPA standard, but did not meet the Ohio EPA standard, and as a result of that, the Ohio EPA, and I'm going to use the word mandated, which could be a little strong because there wasn't another solution that was, uh, and a waiver was not available, that we are expelling about 20, in the wintertime, about 20 percent of the heated air in that plant, out of the plant, out, just out stacks into the atmosphere to meet the air standard of the Ohio EPA. And I think this is this question of you know, where is the regulatory balance? How do we get to an OSHA standard that says we have always met versus an EPA standard, and I'm going to call it Ohio EPA standard, that we're not meeting, and the solution is well, take 20 percent well, of your heat Mr. out of your plant and I put it outside. I appreciate your concern. Uh, do you have legislative suggestions to alleviate this burden uh, that would also ensure safety and quality of the product? Do you have any specific suggestions, or are you just saying, well, the regulations are bad? I'm, I'm not an engineer. I can't understand why there's an OSHA standard that we can meet and an Ohio standard that says it has to be significantly more, uh, I'm going to say, more restrictive. And why is one so different than the other? I, I'm not an engineer that can answer it other than they told me the answer is take 20 percent of the hot air out of your plant and blow it out into the sky. Well, I, I appreciate your concern. Uh, perhaps some legislative uh, suggestions would be more helpful than just uh, saying that you don't like the, uh, the current regime. Um, is Phillips Manufacturing producing energy efficient components for new housing? The materials that we produce uh, are used as part of building construction. They are not necessarily a direct energy uh, efficient component. It's uh, roll formed metal steel, and steel it, uh, itself is not a, uh, uh, an item which would create uh, an insulation or, or an uh, energy barrier. Thank you. Um, Mr. Martin, uh, you mentioned uh, how the, uh, it's, uh, the, the difficulty finding labor uh, you know, given the high unemployment in the last few years, do you have any way to explain why we're still uh, having labor shortages in specific areas? Well, in, uh, in Texas specifically, the uh, unemployment is down mainly because of the energy uh, sector and the two big oil plays, uh, Eagle Ford Shell and the Middle and Odessa play. So in Texas, we have a real problem because the oil industry is paying so much for uh, their workers that they're leaving construction and going into energy. So that's our problem. At least locally. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, Jerry. And now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to our panelists. As you know, this is the subcommittee on commerce, manufacturing, and trade. CMT. I'm assuming I'm speaking for Mr. Martin, but with this group, we should change that to mean come move to Texas. I object. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for all of y'all if I have time, but first of all, I'd like the answers from Mr. Martin and Mr. Judson. Um, clearly, I know I'm blessed living in Texas 22. Right now, at least 100 new homes are being, being built within two miles of my home in Sugarland, Texas. The sounds of cement trucks, of hammers hitting nails at seven in the morning are commonplace. But that growth we're experiencing in Texas is threatened by a shortage of labor. I know it's hard to find qualified workers. Mr. Martin mentioned unskilled workers such as framers, flooring personnel, HVAC, plumbers, printers, painters, bricklayers, and the lure of the high-paying, low-skilled construction jobs is long gone. When I was growing up in the 1980s, as an 18-year-old, I could not get a construction job, and I craved a construction job. Those jobs paid six-plus dollars an hour compared to working minimum wage at some restaurant for just a little over two bucks and change. 
I mean, I wanted to get on that hot, boiling Texas sun with that asphalt, spread that wherever it needed to go, because I'm getting paid six bucks an hour. I love my 13-year-old son, but his generation won't make that choice. The work is too tough. I know that immigration reform is part of the solution, but we've proven we can't tailor our economic needs with our immigration policies. Somehow, we have to get American kids interested in these jobs again. So my question is, what can we do to encourage our youth to get involved in these jobs again? Starting in the high schools, community colleges, what can we do? Mr. Martin, you're first up, sir. Now, as I said earlier, uh, right now on the Governor Perry's desk is HB 5, which is reforming uh, our school system to allow for vocational training, and I think they'll go a long way to start helping. The, pro the problem is, as I said earlier, uh, right now the a average age for a plumber, electrician, uh, HVAC technician is in the upper 50s. So they're getting closer to retirement age, and there's this huge gap uh, of this skilled workforce that we're going to have to be contended with as we try to bring these young high school kids and right out of high school kids up into the trades and, and, and get them trained so they can make a good living despite the fact the lure of the oil and gas industry. But I think, I think you've got to start this vocational training that we haven't in Texas had for 10 years. Yes, I mean, growing up, I took shop, wood shop in eighth grade. Now, seniors in high school, the first chance you have, have to take wood shop. And look, I've got all 10 fingers. <laughs> It was safe. I learned a lot. Mr. Judson, national perspective. What can we do to get kids excited about these jobs again, get them work, Americans working in construction industry? The, the, ed, the educational training is the key, whether it be on a, uh, through the Home Builder Institute. I mentioned earlier about the deglamorization that's taking place for this industry. Kids coming out of high school do not want to go into the construction industry. It's a, um, it's a respected trade. It has been for years when, when we were coming up and working in the construction trade industry is not perceived that way now. I think there's a perception industry and some things that we as an industry need to do to, uh, to indicate that it is a respected trade and it can be an industry that will foster from a beginning as a bricklayer to running a bricklaying crew. If our average uh, member has 10 or so employees, that's a painting crew, that's a drywall crew. But until the high school student recognizes that's an opportunity for him to advance himself in his own career, it won't happen. And Mr. Scabot, from Phillips Manufacturing perspective, run out of time, but what can we do to encourage our kids to get that education? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to, to my uh, prepared comments. I think it's a question that somewhere over time, uh, however it was generated, the educational system has encouraged everyone to prepare for a college education and not all people should be going to college. Uh, some people have natural skills, some people are born musicians, some people maybe have math skills, maybe some people are born to be a doctor, but there are a lot of people that are born to be uh, plumbers, electricians, I'm going to call it tool and die craftsmen, but they, there's no opportunity for them to get trained, whether it's at least in the experiences that we're seeing in the states that we operate, uh, either in the high school or the community colleges, and somehow we have to get that back into the system so that they see that these opportunities are there and these, uh, the level of unemployment we have now compared to the jobs that are available are simply people who do not have the skills or a place to go for training other than on-the-job training or the uh, employer-provided training uh, to, to learn these trades. We've got to get it back to where it comes in at a much younger level uh, what I'm going to go back and, as you've referred to, Congressman, as the uh, shop classes that started in the high schools and then were continued in the community colleges and network those with manufacturers and contractors so that they can get uh, credit while they work out on the job. Most of us learned a lot of what we learned, not necessarily in school, but on the job training when we got out of school, whether that was um, part of what we're doing uh, in, uh, call it white collar work or what it was, what people were doing in blue collar work. Somehow we've got to get uh, businesses, contractors to interact with the schools and get people back into training that will provide them a long-term skill and a long-term uh, uh, opportunity for compensation and retirement. 
right. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. I'm way over my time, so I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stevens, Mr. Bozzotto, and Mr. Nadal get to those questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All Thank right. You. Mr. McKinley, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Mr. Nadal, thank you very much for talking about our um, Energy Savings Act, uh, that efficiency. I, I hope that, that we'll get uh, adequate consideration and, and we'll get that bill worked. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, my remarks maybe should have been in, the, in an opening statement. Uh, but I'm, I come from the construction industry. Uh, uh, I started in construction in 65 um, and I had a home building company uh, for over 40 years ago I started that. So I come with some degree of, of awareness of what we're talking about here, but my, the concern I've not heard voiced strongly enough, maybe it's not your fault, but I wanna hear some direction. How are we going to get affordable housing for middle-class Americans and low-paid low, low paid people across this country? When we're talking about, when I'm, I'm looking for something in the 125 to 175,000 range. How are we going to achieve that in new homes? Or are we going to tell our American citizens they don't, they're not entitled to a new home. They have to buy an older home and renovate it. I'm really curious about where we're going as a country when we're dividing our major urban centers against our rural America. And rural America, it cannot afford Three hundred and four hundred thousand dollar homes uh, when they're on an income that maybe only is forty thousand dollars a year. So I'm really curious. I hear the issues that you're talking about, and I've experienced as a contractor and an engineer and architect. I understand all those aspects, but I want to see from the other perspective: what are we doing for the people to give them homes that they can afford? Yes, sir. Mr. McKinley. Uh, I, th I think perhaps we haven't been as clear when we object to regulation or express concerns about regulation. Um, there, there's, there's an unstated uh, bias behind that, which is that our goal is to provide, and, and the apartment industry is, is clearly the most affordable form of housing that can be built. But every time a regulation is mandated, every, no matter how meritorious, there's a cost implication that we end up having to put on, put, pass on. And this trade-off that, that you've so appropriately pointed out is the one that, that is a struggle for all of us in our industry. None of us want to see energy consumed uh, unwisely. None of us want to uh, design buildings that are not accessible to everyone. And yet every time a new law or regulation is enacted, whether at the federal level, the local level, or the state level, or altogether, it adds to the cost making housing, making it more difficult for our industry to make housing affordable. Any other responses from some of the others on how we might be able to achieve more affordable housing? So I, I really don't want to get to a point that we tell middle class America they're not entitled to a new home. They can't afford one. They have to buy an older home and fix it up. I think everyone in America, I'd, I'd love to see that be able to reach out so that they can have a new home. I can remember the first home I built um, was in affordable housing, $30,125. People could afford that. Yes, sir. I would echo Mr. Bazzuto's comments about regulation. It accounts to somewhere between 18 and 20 percent of the cost of a home. Now, that's not to say that all regulation is bad or that all codes are bad, because they certainly are not. We support things from uh, quality and safety to the energy efficiency, but there's a point of diminishing return on all those components. Uh, we think a common sense approach needs to be taken. We, need, we think that the um, the, the bureaucratic regulators, and I say that with uh, all due affection, need to, to use some common sense when you're adding 10, 15, 20 percent to a house and it's not a function of soundness or safety, then maybe it's not as necessary as what you might think. You've got 20 percent in the cost of the land. If there were some 
leniencies allowed for affordable housing in, when you're developing a piece of property and you could do it for half of that cost, you've cut 10% out of the cost of the production of that house. So there are a lot of small components that could go into reducing that $130,000 house to $100,000 if that's what you had the cooperation in generating. All right, gentlemen's time has Thank expired. You very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Johnson from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I associate myself with the comments that uh, some of my other colleagues have made. Uh, the American dream for millions of Americans is embodied in the idea of owning their own home, uh, of finally putting a, a stake in the ground and saying, this is, this is my domain, this is my family. Uh, this is where we're going to plant our roots. And so uh, uh, this hearing that showcases the importance of the housing and rental market, I think, is extremely important to the American people. There's no doubt that the housing market is one of the main drivers of our uh, economy, uh, one of the main indicators as to the health of our economy as a whole. And we should do everything in our power to uh, help not only uh, these gentlemen uh, and their companies sitting at this table, but those all over the country uh, have the resources and the, uh, the ability, uh, the tools that they need to help the millions of Americans uh, find housing, uh, build that home, uh, enjoy the American dream, and at the same time create the millions of jobs that are, uh, are in the waiting. My first question is for Mr. Jordan. Uh, there have been a number of articles lately talking about rising building material costs. Um, what obstacles are builders facing in terms of obtaining necessary building materials to complete their projects? It is unfortunately a uh, supply-demand scenario that is not uncommon. Uh, as was pointed out by Mr. Stevens, the, they have uh, shuttered plants the productive capacity has been diminished, and now that the industry is picking up again, it's a catch-up between building materials and, and the price. But the price has escalated so dramatically, as would be expected. It's not a price gouging issue. It's just a supply-demand agreement between buyer and seller. But uh, as, as was pointed out, if, if plants are operated more efficiently, if they can be brought on a little quicker, we can minimize the peaks and valleys in those cycles. Are there, are there any actions that you think uh, Congress should take to try and help uh, resolve that problem? From what I have heard today and what I've heard around the industry as I travel in the country is um, the, the regulation for starting back up some of these plants is different than it might have been when those plants were built five years ago. So to have to operate to a new standard um, creates some hardship for them financially and creates some time delays in bringing that product back online. Now, now you're talking about regulatory reform again. Yes, uh, sir, and, I am. And, and, and I agree with you. I'm not saying that in a negative way. I, I agree with you. Every time a new regulation uh, comes out that, uh, that stymies the industry, that puts a plant uh, out of business, uh, even a new owner that might come in and try to start that back up. Uh, it takes more money, more time. Uh, you lose a lot of the uh, intellectual property uh, of the workforce, uh, and it's, uh, it's a problem. What about, what about on the soft side, the money side? I, I hear another common concern from home builders, realtors, and, and potential home buyers, the inability of uh, obtaining loans and financing. Uh, now, we all know that there was a serious problem in the last decade of, of predatory loan making and uh, people taking out loans for which they simply could not meet their obligations. However, it now seems that perhaps Congress and uh, federal regulators have overcorrected these mistakes and are stopping qualified home buyers from obtaining the funds they need. Uh, you addressed this in your testimony as well as uh, your opinion that the issue is ripe for congressional action. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What do you think we ought to do? Well, the two, the two bills that are, have been introduced already are solid bills. They have bipartisan support, uh, and I don't recall off the top, but I think it's uh, Senate Bill 1002 and maybe the House 1255. 
but they both are pragmatic, they are both logical in their approach, and they, again, as I mentioned, they are, they are bipartisan. Okay. I think if there is lending available to the builders, then the houses can be built at a more affordable cost, because builders now are paying almost a usurious rate for, for funding, to get funding. They're not getting it through the lending institutions that we traditionally uh, were afforded. Uh, one more quick question in my remaining time. What would the wood mact rule, the, the EPA's proposed wood mact rule, uh, how would that affect you folks? Mr. Stevens? Yeah. <clears throat> in my uh, testimony, what I said is the current version of the wood mact would cost uh, LP about $13 million with really no improvement in technology or in productivity. And basically that's going to cost jobs. That's going to cost passing on costs to uh, to your customers, I mean, that money doesn't come out of thin air, right? It's going to increase, not only do we have a $13 million capital expenditure, but also increase our use of natural gas. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Now the gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. I thank the panel for their testimony. And uh, this question actually goes to the entire panel, whoever would like to respond. Uh, in recent months, sales of single-family homes in the Tampa Bay area, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and Tampa, that area have risen by more than 17 uh, percent. Throughout the entire state of Florida, sales have been up uh, by almost 10 uh, percent. While this is good news, many analysts have suggested that most of these sales are being made to cash investors, and I see that as well. To what extent does new home construction follow the trends in the larger real estate market. Who would like to go first? Yes, please. I'll be, I'll be glad to start. Um, we go back to that supply demand scenario. Florida was the epicenter of foreclosure. So the people are going in now to, to gobble up these houses at, uh, and pay cash for them, many times from an investor standpoint. But as that supply diminishes, you're going to see new construction follow suit because it, uh, you still have that pent-up demand for families that are being created. About 40 percent of the homes sold in this country are first-time buyers. So as those people are beginning to um, go into the market to look for homes and there's nothing available, uh, new homes will be built. And if the financing is available, not only for the construction process but for their permanent financing, um, then the economy will start again. Very good. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, this is for uh, Mr. Bazudo. Uh, you urge Congress to insist that any new rules from uh, HUD or EPA or DOE have demonstrable benefits that justify the cost of uh, compliance. Can you identify any current or proposed rules that do not meet that standard in your eyes? <laughs> um. Well, I, I guess um, I, I can I'll cite a recent HUD rule that where HUD has changed the uh, lending limits um, and in requiring um, that on uh, larger loans, um, the amount of equity is uh, that required from the developer has to be significantly different, uh, greater than it had been previously. Yet this change was done absent any experience with uh, loans of that nature having gotten in trouble. So it is, it is the kind of thing that has major impacts on the industry, um, has, uh, particularly if one was in the middle of the process, um, I, I suspect if I um, had 24 hours, I probably could, could come up with a hundred examples of, of rules and regulations that are in the nature of, of having been imposed because they were good ideas, but not having any real benefit economically that justifies the costs associated with them. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in there? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Yield back to my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bilarakis. Now, uh, as uh, Mr. Bazzuto 
you don't have a question because we're done. Uh, but one of the things that we get to do as uh, members of Congress is to uh, submit questions to you to answer. Uh, Mr. Nadell, you didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to provide additional comments uh, when we were talking about the energy efficiency. You can guarantee I'll submit a question so you can provide that answer. Mr. Bozzuto, we'll probably ask you a question giving you that opportunity to list those hundred examples. <laughs> All right, you may not have to put a hundred, but uh, some, some good examples would be appreciated. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, for those folks that uh, we submit a written question to you, you would, uh, we would appreciate a, a timely answer. Um, timely would be within a few days for me. Uh, for some folks, it could be six months, but I prefer a week or two, okay? I would appreciate the uh, timely answer, and you guys were excellent. All of you provided us uh, good insight in a variety of different topics, and you are now excused. And we're going to take a couple of minutes while we switch panels here, and you'll see some maybe some work on our microphones. Uh, we've learned that in our back room, they couldn't hear the... Uh, witnesses, so we're going to see why that's occurring. So thank you all. You are dismissed, so if you have planes, you... Myself like a complete fool. All right, I'm talking. Not really know what I'm saying. Should sing the song. <laughs> okay. My name is Bill Shaw. I'm the founder of William Shaw and Associates. I'm here today to testify as a remodeler in this industry. I look forward to talking more about all the different issues that affect our industry. And uh, especially, specifically about some of the issues that face us. So specifically, some of the issues that face us are having to do with the EPA. Do you care for water? There could probably use one of these that's upside down. This one is trash as well. Thank you.
Excuse us while we're amusing ourselves up here with Peter Welch. Very good. Well, welcome, second panel. Uh, and to begin, I will ask unanimous consent to let Mr. Welch speak for one minute. Hearing none, you are recognized. The gentleman from Vermont is recognized. Uh, first of all, I, I thank the chairman, but I want to reassure the panel that you'll be treated much better than I was when I arrived. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming, but I especially want to thank Ludi Biddle uh, from NeighborWorks, who's been doing this incredible job in Vermont, uh, uh, getting energy efficiency out into the remotest parts of a rural county uh, and an old urban city, a uh, city we're very proud of, Rutland. And the thing that's been so exciting, uh, Ludi, to watch your work was it's regular people uh, getting out and making direct contact with homeowners and wading through all the challenges, financial, uh, impractical, that they face to make that decision uh, to retrofit their homes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was down one time visiting some homes that they've worked on, but then I went into this class where there are all these folks who were laid off because of the housing collapse. This is a few years ago. And they were learning about how they could use their skills to do something in their neighborhood to save their neighbors money and get them back uh, earning cash. So it's been so tremendous to see the implementation of an idea. You know, we, we, we talk a lot around here, but you all do <laughs> get things done, and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much for being here, and uh, very proud of all the work that you and your team have accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, now, the rest of you probably won't have as glaring and pro uh, an introduction. Uh, as glowing as that one was, but uh, Ms. Biddle, you, you deserve that, especially as being our only woman panelist today, so appreciate you being here. So uh, by introductions, I'm going to go down uh, as I did before when I introduce, uh, when, when you start to speak or recognize, I'll give you your introduction. So Mr. Robinson, uh, Buddy is Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for Kohler Company, who I think we have a few of your products in our house. I'm, I'm so, glad to hear it. And so you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I'm Buddy Robinson. I'm with Kohler Company, and I thank you for the opportunity to present Kohler Company's perspective on the current housing situation in the United States and prospects for its future. Although housing starts may exceed a million uh, for 2013, uh, no one in the industry would claim this is a robust, a robust market uh, by historic uh, standards. It's well below the two million starts we experienced in 2005, but thankfully it is appreciably above the 500,000 starts at the bottom in 2009. Kohler Company has played an important role in housing uh, for more than a century. Uh, we will celebrate actually our 140th anniversary later this year uh, John Michael Kohler, an Austrian immigrant, uh, came to Wisconsin, bought a farm implements company making cast iron and steel farm implements in 1873. He took a product out of his line, he heated it up to 1700 degrees Fahrenheit, he put a bunch of enamel frit on it, and he took a picture, he put it in his catalog, and he said of the product, it would work as a horse trough for hog scalder. That, when furnished with four legs, will serve as a bathtub. And thus, Kohler got into the bath business. <laughs> so Kohler ideas of craftsmanship and technology are at work all around the world. We uh, currently have four corporate groups, uh, kitchen and bath, power, interiors, and hospitality. We employ more than 30,000 associates. Uh, we have operations, uh, including more than 50 manufacturing facilities. And we sell our products literally on every continent. Uh, generally speaking, Kohler Company is bullish on the prospects for a continued recovery and growth in the housing market. However, there are a number of economic obstacles and federal policies uh, confronting America that could derail our rosy outlook. Uh, we look, uh, I'll turn to a few of those now. First, home buyers and remodelers need access to affordable financing. 
Uh, simply put, we need policies that encourage private institutions to participate in the home finance market. We need clarity in rules and regulations surrounding lending standards. Uh, we need consistent regulation and certification of appraisers and a greater general sensitivity in Washington toward burdensome processes that add time and cost without meaningful benefit to the mortgage finance market. Secondly, we need national water use standards based on science. Patchwork regulations applied selectively create unreasonable burdens on enterprises, and they virtually guarantee a race to the lower, lowest water usage levels regardless of good science or maximum efficiency. Kohler wholeheartedly supports the EPA WaterSense program. This is a public-private partnership promoting water efficiency, and it is working well. It deserves congressional funding. EPA reports that WaterSense labeled products have helped Americans save 287 billion gallons of water. That's $4.7 billion in water, water and energy uh, bills uh, you know, avoided. And we've, we're proud to have been named EPA WaterSense Manufacturing Partner of the Year uh, three times since the program was launched in 2008, including this past year in 2012. Uh, thirdly, we need policies that build the skilled and unskilled workforce. Kohler Company supports the intent of the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill pending in the Senate. It's overdue. As we face growing shortages in plumbers and other skilled trades, government should be doing what it can to support vocational and trade schools, as well as supporting qualified apprenticeship programs. Furthermore, we need to offer work visas to all who graduate from U.S. colleges and universities, particularly those with science and engineering degrees. And finally, there needs to be greater sensitivity in government uh, to rules and regulations that drive up manufacturing costs. Often, we do not have sufficient lead time to prepare for oncoming regulations. In other cases, good science is missing and decisions are based on faulty or incomplete studies. In still other instances, contradictions occur between and among federal agencies that share re regulatory responsibilities. So in conclusion, Housing has pulled the U.S. economy out of every recession since the Great Depression. It remains critically important that governments at all levels help create and support an environment conducive to home building. Kohler Company's success illustrates, that in, illustrates what industrious immigrants can accomplish through the in, free enterprise system and a healthy housing sector. And I thank you uh, for this opportunity. And, Look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Now, Mr. Shaw, you are the founder of William Shaw and Associates, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning, uh, Chairman Terry and the members of the panel. My name is Bill Shaw. I'm the founder of uh, William Shaw and Associates. We're a design build remodeling company located in the great state of Houston, Texas. Few industries have struggled more during the Great Recession than the home building industry. While remodelers have not experienced the extreme highs and lows, like single family home building, the remodeling industry has certainly struggled over the last few years. However, predictions indicate a very gradual yet steady recovery. Fortunately, predictions, remodeling is a, a, an industry right now that's heavily regulated and given the regulatory, regulatory environment we face as an industry and as small businesses, I would like to share with you my thoughts on some key regulations that could hamper our recovery. Recent amendments and changes to EPA's lead, renovation, repair, and painting rule are already constraining our businesses. The final rule, which took effect over three years ago, require, requires renovation work that disturbs more than six square feet in a home built prior to 1978 to follow the new lead safe work practices. Poor implementation of the rule by the EPA has resulted in considerable compliance costs and has hindered both job growth and energy efficiency upgrades in older homes. The first important change to the RRP was the elimination of a consumer's ability to waive compliance if no children under six or a pregnant woman resides in the home, also known as the opt-out provision. This change dismantled everything EPA originally included in the rule to ensure that it was not overly costly to small businesses. 
For small contractors, these additional costs have to be passed on to the consumer, which increases the chances that the consumer will hire another likely uncertified contractor to do the work, or what we're finding a lot in Houston, they're going to do the work themselves, which may increase the likelihood of disturbing lead-based paint. The 2008 RRP also relied on a new lead uh, test kit. The EPA expected the more accurate test kit to be commercially available by the time the rule went into effect. Three years later, we still don't have a new test kit. And the old test kits can produce up to a 60% false positives, meaning that in many uh, cases, consumers are needlessly paying additional compliance costs. We believe the EPA should reopen the rule and redo their cost-benefit analysis. Another challenge we face is with green remodeling. The green remodeling trend is growing quickly, and I myself am a certified green professional. But one of the major barriers to investing in green construction is that appraisals often do not reflect the increase in construction costs or the value of future energy savings. If my customers cannot realize this value, they won't seek green upgrades. Voluntary green building rating systems, though, have helped demystify the value of green. While there are many in the market, the ANSI-approved ICC 7000 National Green Building Standard is widely used in residential construction. This standard focuses on energy efficiency, water and resource conservation, and more. There are minimum requirements in each of these categories. It also features an entire section dedicated to remodeling, a key to addressing the inefficiencies found in older, in older buildings, which are the real gas guzzlers of the built environment. Federal buildings must now meet green standards, but unfortunately, only one system is allowed, LEED. LEED is not a consensus, sta consensus standard. Agencies are required to use these standards because they allow for all relevant stakeholders to participate, while also protecting against special interest groups hoping to prioritize one particular product or technique. Second, given one prioritary organization a monopoly does not promote innovation or cost-effective decision-making. Different rating systems may also be better suited for certain project types. Lastly, no standalone residential green standard was reviewed, even though 16 percent of the federal portfolio is residential space. GSA is currently reviewing this policy, and I hope the recommendation allows choice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Wilhelms, Vice President of Architectural Sales, Midwest Brick and Block. Appreciate you being here, and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. On behalf of our company and the concrete masonry industry, I would like to thank you for providing us this opportunity to share our perspective on the importance of a healthy home building industry. My name is Mark Wilhelms, and I am Vice President of Architectural Sales for Midwest Block and Brick. Our family business employs over 275 full-time employees at our 21 locations in Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Illinois. We manufacture and sell concrete block, concrete landscape products, and distribute a wide range of masonry and landscape materials to the residential market segment. However, only about 90 percent of our companies typically operate a single plant and in a local market and remain family owned. Nationwide, there are uh, approximately 350 block manufacturing companies operating about 600 plants. In other words, we typically make and ship our products in about a 60 mile radius due to the heavy weight of our materials. This local market focus means that our employees, are, our, employees our suppliers, and our customers are local. We are truly the ultimate American business model. I am pleased that your subcommittee is holding this hearing today on the value of the home building industry. The construction industry has suffered a lot these past six years. At our company, this recession forced us to cut over 30 percent of our workforce. When this poor construction market is combined with the ripple effect of the banking industry and major increase in medical insurance costs, 
it becomes very difficult for producers to stay in business. In fact, over the past 15 years, we've seen close to 300 producers close their doors. Like most producers, our company began with the production of concrete block for the construction of basements and new homes during the 1940s. Back then, as the demand for homes grew, so did our company. The demand for homes created jobs in the local communities where our company started. It's the same residential construction market that has led to every growth cycle experienced in our company. In fact, uh, other construction sectors are driven by the residential market. So we will begin to see longer delays in the construction of retail centers, schools, hospitals, and municipal buildings as we wait for the housing market to recover. We know a strong housing market is the stimulus for most all other building sectors. Looking beyond the effects of a poor housing market, we must also recognize the changing construction industry and our ability to adapt the method and materials used to build buildings is changing quickly. The market is demanding more energy efficient building materials, green building products, more education of architects and engineers, and a larger number of workers to move, in, to move into the skilled trades which we currently have. Each of these demands requires a consistent and substantial level of investment to remain competitive. Within our industry, we recognize the need to invest in our products. However, with Block being a relatively low margin commodity type product with many small producers, maintaining that consistent level of funding in our own research, education, and promotion becomes difficult. For this reason, our producers overwhelmingly support an industry-led funding program. We have solicited the leadership and assistance of Representative Brett Guthrie and Representative Kathy Castor to introduce bipartisan legislation in the form of H.R. 1563 to create a commodity checkoff program for the concrete masonry industry. This legislation has been referred to this subcommittee, would not create the checkoff program, but simply authorize our producers to conduct a referendum, and if a majority support, then enact the program. We believe that this private industry approach, which requires no federal resources, is the only way to enable our industry to effectively promote itself and to continue to provide valuable building solutions for the public and generate the jobs that will naturally follow. In closing, our company and our industry sit with production capacity in reserve, and we are ready and anxious to support badly needed growth and development to compensate for pent-up demand. We encourage this subcommittee to play its role in supporting policies and legislation that will ultimately stimulate construction growth, stabilize prop property asset values, free up investment capital, and reduce the cost to operate domestic construction and manufacturing businesses. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Well timed. Uh, now, uh, Ludi Biddle is Executive Director, Neighborhood Works of Western Vermont, and somebody that Peter Welch is very fond of. <laughs> You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And it's mutual. <laughs> thank you, Chairman Terry, and thank you, Ranking. Could you just pull your microphone a little bit closer to you? Thank you very much, Chairman Terry and um, Ranking Member Schakowsky and all of the members of the subcommittee. This is a great honor, and thank you, Representative Welch, for making this possible. <laughs> I'm here to share with you the benefits that the residents of a small county in Vermont are enjoying from an investment made in energy efficiency and to encourage you to consider how the whole country could benefit from a similar investment. In 2010, NeighborWorks of Western Vermont, a small nonprofit housing organization, joined an august group of cities and states to receive a Better Buildings grant from the Department of Energy. The purpose of the DOE program was to ramp up demand for energy efficiency measures in the residential sector. We were the only housing group to apply. We said we would encourage 1,000 households in Rutland County to go through the retrofit process in three years, and no one thought we could do it because, to put that into perspective, only 26 Rutland households had gone through the process in 2009. Rutland County is the second poorest county in Vermont, subject to all the social ills and economic challenges that our stressed communities are, so we were not the typical demographic for efficiency programs. But we heat our homes six months of the year, our housing stock is some of the oldest in the country, 
our low and moderate income residents, the least likely to participate, were the most likely to benefit from this program. And our mission, uh, our experience, is about helping make homeownership affordable. What better way to achieve savings and stability and comfort and health and safety for homeowners than to add air sealing and insulation and the occasional boiler and new roof to their homes? I'll share some of the results and then tell how we accomplish this and what our hopes are for continuing. As of the close of this year's heating season, 570 households just in Rutland County had completed retrofits on their homes. The average homeowner is saving 386 gallons of fuel oil a year, which times about $3.85 a gallon equals about $1,500 a year every year from now on. This means that this past winter, because these 570 homes were using less fuel, about $850,000 did not leave Rutland County to buy oil. 850,000 stayed in this little county to fuel our own economy, and it will stay with us every year from now on. Actually, it will be even more significant because we hope another 400 households will finish their retrofits by the end of this summer. Another way we've contributed to the economy of Rutland County is in creating jobs. Most of the contractors who were specially trained and building performance institute certified through Efficiency Vermont were, when we started, a one-man operation, often an independent builder who'd been trying to augment his income during the recession. Since we began, every one of the 13 or 14 independents have added to their companies. We actually have the names and addresses of 62 people who have jobs created around our program, so we're not just relying on statistics to indicate this. One of our contractors, for example, went from three retrofit customers in 2009 to 40 retrofit customers in 2011 and 12, producing a gross income just for his company of $300,000. At one point, all the contractors were so busy, a three-month backlog, that we created a small company of our own called LaborWorks for NeighborWorks. We now maintain a pool of workers we can loan out to the contractors when they need help keeping up with demand. How do we do this? We are and always have been a housing organization. We know that you don't advertise or announce programs and they will come. For example, in Shrewsbury, we enlisted five volunteer conservation commission members to call all 400 residents. While incentive payments and efficiency measures are essential, we used our grant money to provide people to help other people understand this process. And we simply provided old-fashioned customer service, something we call the Melanie Factor after the head of our coordinating team. I'm, I'm rushing now. We, we provided help with understanding the technical and financial choices. We like to tell people, we will let the dog out, we'll let the contractor in, and we'll help you understand all of the in information you need in between. Um, because we were concerned, and there was concern, of course, that providing these services was expensive and adding to the already existing efficiency programs. We um, engaged the Cadmus Group, a research firm that is highly regarded in the energy industry to conduct an industry standard cost-benefit analysis. They found lower income households earning below 80% of area median income were 164% more likely to install measures our heat squad program, which is what we call it, is cost effective with a societal cost test of 1.72, and the heat squad on its own, with efficiency Vermont programs is even more cost effective. In other words, not only is the added cost of the heat squad producing more benefit than it's costing, but it's also, the, but also the NeighborWorks heat squad is providing non-monetized value to society in that significantly more people in the low to moderate income homes are benefiting. I'll stop now and hope that you'll have questions that would address the rest of I this. I think you can bank on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bovio, did I say that right? Yes, you did. Fantastic. Operations Manager, Bovio Advanced Comfort and Energy Solutions. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this subcommittee for this opportunity to offer my perspective on the role of home performance contracting in home economics and energy policy. 
My name is Brian Bovio, and I'm, I am vice president of my family's business. I gave myself a promotion. Um, Bovio Heating, Plumbing, Cooling, Insulation, located in New Jersey. We are a third-generation HVAC contracting company that has also transitioned into a whole house energy efficiency retrofit company. We offer heating, air conditioning, plumbing, insulation, weatherization, and energy auditing services. Essentially, we work with homeowners to increase their home's energy performance, comfort, health, and safety. I come to this subcommittee both as a licensed contractor and as chairman of the board of Efficiency First. Efficiency First is a national nonprofit trade association of nearly 800 member companies, most of which are small businesses employing 5 to 50 people. We have membership in all 50 states and aim to support the policies that will support a sustainable and scalable home retrofit market. Efficiency First contractors work every day sitting at kitchen tables across America, helping homeowners understand why their energy bills are so high, why their daughter's bedrooms are so cold, or why their son's asthma acts up when the furnace is on. Americans understand that energy efficiency is about their home economics and comfort and their ability to raise their families there. The average American family spends over $1,800 per year on energy, which equates to over $200 billion across the nation. This represents 22% of all U.S. energy consumption, 35% more than is used for passenger cars and trucks combined. Energy efficiency is unique in that it creates its own cash flow. Less money spent on energy means more money to purchase groceries and save for college. So why don't all American homeowners undertake the energy efficiency upgrades they need? One key reason is the upfront costs. Efficiency First and I would like to thank Congressman, Congressman David McKinley and Peter Welch for their leadership on homes, home performance and for introducing H.R. 2128, the Homeowner Managing Energy Savings or HOMES Act. This bill would help address the hurdle of those upfront costs by providing incentives for homeowners with rebates to help cover the cost of home energy efficiency upgrades. The rebates are earned, the size of the rebate is based on the energy savings the upgrade will provide, not the type of product they purchase and homeowners will always pay at least half of the upgrade cost. Why should tax dollars be used to offset efficiency costs? Believe me, I understand the need to use public dollars wisely. As a small business, we understand the need to budget our own funds wisely, so I'm not asking for a handout. This country needs the energy savings that the Homes Act pro provides. Saving energy is a public good. Homeowners are being asked to provide that public good to save energy and to make expensive efficiency investments because we want them to save money on their utility bills and because the country needs them to reduce costs across the energy system as a whole and help achieve the broader goals of energy independence, pollution reduction, and job creation. We are not properly valuing the very real public and resource benefits energy efficiency provides. Instead, we are asking homeowners to pay for the full burden and cost of these improvements, often up front and out of pocket. The Homes Act fixes that. Mr. Chairman, retrofitting inefficient homes will also create hundreds of thousands of U.S. jobs in some of the hardest hit industries, including construction and manufacturing. These new jobs are primarily jobs that cannot be outsourced. You cannot hire a contractor from China, and the materials used in improving homes are on average 90 percent made in the USA. Shipping insulation is as smart as shipping air. My business and employees know personally how home performance can create jobs. Bovios has been able to grow despite uh, grow its business thanks to making the transition to home performance company. Despite horrendous economic conditions, we have more than doubled our workforce in the past few years. All of these employees are working 40 plus hours a week, no short weeks, and have full benefits. Revenues are also up dramatically from before we started in home performance. This change in my business and the businesses of many others across the country was made possible with the help of public dollars and incentive programs. Incentive programs like the Homes Act put forward by bipartisan policymakers at the state level who saw the need enacted. Mr. Chairman, the major players we need to make the home performance industry economically sustainable over the long haul are already here. We're just not yet to scale. Those that claim the industry should stand up without incentives are not acknowledging that every other energy resource receives incentives, despite already being at scale. Energy efficiency is an undervalued resource, and home performance deserves investment. We believe that a smart national incentive coordinated with local infrastructure will enable a transformation in the residential energy efficiency market. This subcommittee can help by supporting the passage of the Homes Act. I want to thank this subcommittee on behalf of the thousands of contractors who are working every day to help homeowners invest and improve their homes. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, start with you, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> The, uh, the, it, it's interesting as a remodeler that uh, I, I guess many of us 
I didn't think about the lead rule and how it would impact, and I would assume most of the remodeling is in older homes. Um, so when the EPA, when they eliminated the opt out, could you, first of all, what notice was there? Why did they do that? And how specifically did it impact a typical remodeling job for a home built before 1978? Well, I don't, I don't even know where to start on that. But yeah, and you got to do it in about a minute. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, as an industry, and remodelers in particular, we were, we were at the table with putting this whole thing together. Um, and we're very serious about lead poisoning, and so I don't want to imply that, that what happened after this thing uh, went into effect in, in, uh, in 2010, I think it was in July of 2010, what happened was is that we didn't get to the table to a change that occurred, uh, I think it was in September, when because of a lawsuit and a settlement with the, uh, with the environmentalists, the EPA all of a sudden threw this opt out and, and took it off the table. Sorry to interrupt. Was that part of the settlement agreement is to eliminate the opt-out? Yes. yes, it was. So what happened to us is, is that we went from 36 million homes to almost 80 million that were now included. And we also added about 336 million in compliance costs. So for us, it was... It was, it was a, a huge impact, uh, probably one of the biggest things that, uh, uh, that took the, the ability of the consumer to make a choice. Just real quickly, what, by eliminating that opt-out for, uh, for a home that could opt-out, what was the additional cost for a typical project, generally well, speaking? What happened is, is that, you know, when you took the opt-out, then every single household that was in a home prior to 1978 became eligible. And now you take a test kit that doesn't work, and what happens in, in most of the remodelers that I take that even want to get involved with this is, is that you have to assume every house has lead. So there is no alternative. All right. Mr. Bovio. Uh, your company seems to be maybe not to the level of remodeling, but certainly uh, you will make some changes to a home under your program. Absolutely. What, what, what's the typical uh, assessment, uh, assessment meaning conclusion of what has to be done to a house that you'll work on? What is the average cost? You mentioned incentives, and it, does that cover the cost, and where do the incentives come from? Um, currently, I work in a program in New Jersey that covers uh, up to half of the costs. Uh, I'm a I'm a third generation HVAC contractor, so most of our leads come in as someone that needs heating and slash or air conditioning. So most of our jobs are starting as them, and then we convert them into a, a home performance project, and we talk to them about upgrading their building shell, which would be air sealing, uh, making the home tighter, performing insulation upgrades to reduce the BTU load of the heating and air conditioning equipment we need to put in, reduce the equipment sizing. Um, those projects can range around $15,000, um, generally speaking. And the incentives program from New Jersey will cover 7,500 of the- uh, uh, Up to 5,000. Up, up to 5,000. Yes. Is there a financing mechanism for the rest? New Jersey does have a financing mechanism for the rest, uh, a $10,000, 0% loan, which is why I told you that average job comes in around five, uh, 15000 uh, Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, but uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, real quickly, you make a lot of products, but I'm not, I, I don't figure or see where the energy efficiency occurs in the use of your products. Is there an energy efficiency component to your products? Well, you have to remember we do more than make toilets, so on our... Well, yeah, that's where I usually get reminded of your products, though. Well, that's, uh, you know, our name appears in all the best places, as they say. So we, uh, we also, on the power side of our business, make home gensets. 
and you know this is becoming a uh, a less and less a luxury item and more and more something that as our population ages in place and they're expected to receive their health care needs in their home uh, we have a uh, part of the spec of these homes often includes a backup power source because the power goes down and your dialysis or whatever machinery in your home doesn't work. Uh, that's a real issue and you only have so much battery life. So I, I think, you know, when you look at energy and just broadly speaking energy issues uh, in this country, we need to be looking more and more about the security, the infrastructure uh, for energy delivery to homes as we look at homes more and more to accomplish more things. Uh, they will, as I say, become many hospitals for most of us as we age, uh, and they will also raise children and uh, send people to college, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think the, the, the breadth of what we're asking this, you know, uh, capital to do, this home on the ground to do, is expanding and expanding, and at the same time we're, we're being asked to comply with far more, uh, you know, detailed and I would in certain circumstances say onerous uh, regulations at all levels. All right. Thank you very much and my time has expired and recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for her five minutes. Thank you. First, let me say, Mr. Robinson, I have been to the American Club. You spoke about immigration reform. Don't you call the restaurant there Im immigrants, is it? Yes, it is the immigrant. Yeah, the immigrant. Great restaurant. Huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to just comment on the um, lead renovation and repair. Well, I've, I've been addressing the lead issue for a very long time in toys and homes, et cetera. And I, I, I have to say I'm a big supporter of that rule because let's face it, these homes after renovation often are sold, flipped, um, people are moving in and, in and out. And lead is one of the most toxic, one of the most dangerous toxins um, that, uh, that affect more than one million children. I've met some of those children, and it's really devastating. Even exposures to very low levels of lead harms the development of children's brains, causing learning disabilities, behavioral problems, et cetera. But it's also a concern for the, the workers who can suffer cardiovascular damage, kidney damage, damage to central nervous system. And the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health has found that construction workers bring lead dust home leading to higher blood levels in the children of construction workers than in their neighbors. So that I think the LRRP is an important tool in reducing these exposures and ensuring that renovations and repairs that disturb lead pain are done with basic safeguards by trained and certified professionals is very important. It's been supported by public health groups, by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, and it's being implemented. Renovation firms have been certified. Workers have been trained. In Illinois, there are over 5,000 firms certified for lead safe renovations. And I just think that um, changing it to an opt-out would undermine important protections for workers, for future home, homeowners and their children, and visitors to, to homes. Um, but, but I want to um, turn to uh, uh, another subject for, for some, some questions. Um, Mr. Bovio, in your testimony, you wrote, Effic Efficiency first contractors work every day with homeowners sitting at kitchen tables across America, helping them understand why their energy bills are so high and that um, retrofitting homes will put energy savings back in the wallets of Americans, families, and communities and create hundreds of thousands of jobs, et cetera. Um, so I understand that your company has seen success lately. So yes or no, um, has it been your experience that if more consumers knew how much energy they could save and how much money they could save through retrofitting that we would see a lot more people interested in improving the energy efficiency of their homes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and Ms. Biddle, your testimony stressed the importance of informing homeowners of the, the money that um, they could save. Can you talk about the, the methods in your experience that have been the most effective and successful in helping people understand how they can save money and convincing them that these are really important things to do in their home? Yes, um, I, 
as I said, as a housing agency for 26 years, we've known how to talk to people about their specific challenges or questions or needs. So we've addressed the efficiency measures in the same way. It's very much a one-on-one -on -one conversation or where possible, two-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it's, it's <coughs> explaining the, the, the specifics. In most cases, you know, we can indicate that the cost of the loan is less, if, if a loan is necessary, the cost of a loan is less than the savings that would be accomplished on a monthly basis. And once a person understands that, you know, using their own numbers it, wherever possible, it's a very easy, um, it's a very easy project to understand for anyone, and any, everyone benefits from it. It's a matter of making it very clear. It's still an esoteric kind of proposition to households. It's not, you know, it's not like buying a granite kitchen co counter. It, they don't know yet what it involves and how to, how to get it accomplished. But it's so you don't wait for people to come to you. You go out no, to them. No, we very definitely go out. Um, we we have outreach coordinators. Um, one example I gave in Shrewsbury, um, four five members of our town called 400 fellow residents and just explained, you know, I did this in my house, and if you did this in yours, this is where you'd be this time next year. We're very definitely talking to people specifically about their homes similar to mine, that kind of thing. So, Mr. Bovio, you were talking about the legislation, the Homes Act, is that? Yes. Yeah. Um, but are you saying that some states already have something similar to that and that this would be a good model, has proven to be a good model nationally? Could you explain more? Yeah, I mean, some states do have programs and uh, some have very successful programs, New Jersey being one of them. Uh, that has had a lot of success for me, and we've had a, a lot of energy savings in, in New Jersey with that program. If there was a national model that rolled out and could take home performance nationwide, um, would definitely benefit the, the nation's energy independence. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before recognizing uh, Mr. Long, uh, Mr. Bovia, where are you from in New Jersey? Uh, southern New Jersey. I, I live in Williamstown. Is right where the Atlantic City Expressway starts. Gloucester County? or uh, Yes, sir. I live in Hunterdon County, which has even fewer people than Gloucester County. Uh, <laughs> in the Northwest, however. Okay. Um, and uh, to all of the panel, welcome. Uh, and, of course, to you, Mr. Bovio from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Wentz. Um, Mr. Long from Missouri, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, my friend, Ms. Sikowski, as she always does, made some very good points about the dangers of lead and lead-based paint, and it is a very serious concern. As we all know, I come from a 30-year background as a real estate broker and I hail from a town of Springfield, Missouri that's the third largest city in the state, founded in 1838, so we're not as old as uh, towns out on the East Coast, but we do have a lot of older homes, and a lot of them and a lot of those homes are rental homes, they're starter homes for people that uh, buy the older homes and things, and it's a very, very serious concern. And these rules that they've come up with, with repair and painting rule, I think is what they refer to it as, we stand the chance of people, they don't have to paint their house, and they can let them rot down, they can let the 25 years or whatever since 78 or however many years it's been since 78, they can just let that paint come off and then you get back to the thick lead-based paint that we all know chips and that's what children will eat and peel off the window seal and so uh, that's why we're so very concerned about it. So I'd like to all of us work together on both sides of the island with you all to come up with some kind of a rational program that will work and prevent that from happening because the danger of this paint coming off the paint, the, the non-lead-based paint that people have used over the years that covered up kind of act as a pretty good protective coating, but now that these houses are needed painting, I know in Springfield they can't even find anybody. In Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky said that there's lots of uh, people, but trying to get a house repainted in a town that started in 1838 is a, is a serious problem. So Mr. Shaw, let me direct my first question to you, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that the EPA is not even complying with their own rule by not providing a commercially available accurate test kit. Do you know of any steps that they've taken, I'm talking about the EPA, 
to satisfy the need for these test kits in the near term? Well, first of all, the EPA wrote the lead test standards into their rule, number one. So NHB has asked them repeatedly to get a response from the EPA on what they're going to do with this lead test kit problem, and we have never received a response. We need to have a lead test kit that works. I mean, I, I mean for us in, in Houston, 90% of our work are homes that are pre-1978. This rule really has a direct effect on us. And what we've been told by our attorneys time and time again is we cannot take the risk of a false positive or a false negative. So if we think the house does not test for lead, and it does, and we don't do the lead safe work practices, we're liable. Well, what does EPA tell you when you tell them, hey, you know, you've got this written into the lawn, we need these test kits? Well, you're, you're not going to believe this, but what they tell us. Yeah, I would. They tell us that there's another way of doing this, that you can send the, the, the paint chips to their approved laboratories. Well, there are not enough of them. And then if I came into your house and tore your kitchen or your bathroom up and, and then did this testing and said, you know what, you're going to have to wait six to eight weeks for us to get the results back. And people just, my, con, my customers are not going to wait. Just, well, and it's, that's it's, unreasonable. It's not just a remodeling problem as you're in the remodeling business. It's, like I say, landlords that own these older homes that paint them every three or four years or five in the past history. they would. But now, with this new rule, they can't go in there and paint over what they've been painting over since 1978 for these pre-78 homes. So it's a very serious concern, and I hope that we can get some help from everybody on this issue. Uh, Mr. Wilhelms, thank you for giving me a tour of uh, Midwest Block on May the 1st of this year in Springfield, Missouri, and a uh, very impressive, impressive operation there. And I think that uh, we both agreed things are kind of upturning in the economy and things are getting a little better around there. So uh, again, I appreciate that. I know that you mentioned when I was down there about a checkoff program that you all are interested in, and I know in Washington we're wanting to try and do less instead of more, so what would be the government's involvement in a checkoff program? I understand it's like the uh, got beef or the cattle checkoff program, things like that. Can you in one second uh, yeah. <laughs> explain yourself? Government involvement is, is minimal. Just give our industry the chance to uh, see if it's a right fit for us. Uh, but with a commodity product, we just need that authorization to allow our industry to take a vote. Okay, and I have to ask Mr. Bovio one question, even though I'm out of time. Did, when you gave yourself, and you've already admitted here before this committee, that you gave yourself a promotion, did you also give yourself a raise at the same time, or was it just a title? I did not, I did not. <laughs> okay, I yield back. You, you have a right to remain silent, Mr. Bovio. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Long, especially for that last question from the gentleman from New Jersey. <laughs> Chair recognizes Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions. I'll get to Ms. Biddle in a few minutes. But I, I want to ask Mr. Shaw uh, a question uh, first. How does the National Green Building Standard compare to some of the other rating systems with regards to energy efficiency? One thing that's unique about the National Green Building Standard is that, unlike the other main program, the LEED program, there's a minimum of number of points that you have to score in every category, including energy efficiency. Every category, you have to meet a minimum score. And if you look at the different levels of the National Green Building Standard, just to get a bronze is 15 percent above the the 2009 energy code. So if you go into the emerald, that is 50 percent, and that's every single category mm -hmm. where if you compare it to the LEED program, in which I did a LEED project about a year and a half ago, a LEED gold, it was it, the, the two architects that I did this particular work for, it was 
it was a game of picking and choosing out of different pots to try to get the, the point. So it became all about the points and really not about the ener energy efficiency across the board of a home. Okay, thank you. And then one for Mr. Bovio. Uh, I appreciate your kind words about the Homes Act, um, and we're pleased that we have the support of efficiency first for that legislation. What would that legislation mean for the home performance contracting industry? It would mean a universal standard across the country, which uh, we've, we've never had a, a program to you know, put a, f a firm footprint in the home performance uh, place across the nation, not a small program in this utility and you know that state that we have to deal with, and it's hard to scale up you know nationwide when you're dealing with 50 different programs across the country. If we had one program to shoot for, it could really build the industry up rapidly and Great. we could deploy with. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Biddle. Um, t tell us a little bit about the contracting jobs. I, I mentioned in my opening remark, uh, it was just amazing to me to be there seeing all these. Uh, folks getting training to be able to go out and work and it was nice to see the kind of bounce in their step because uh, times were pretty tough in Rutland then and these folks had been laid off and uh, they really had prospects so I think it would be worth it for all of us to hear more about the contracting jobs that you've been able to create. Well as I said we really started um, at the beginning of our grant period which was 2010 with about 12 or 13 independent contractors, one-man one companies. And as the demand increased, um, they were overwhelmed, so we offered um, some assistance and some encouragement um, for them to hire new people, and we provided the training because it's intensive, technical, advanced training that's required to, to be a BPI certified contractor. And uh, I think that's probably what you were, were, were part of. Um, and as I say, 62 people now have new jobs that were created in the process of this um, three-year period. Um, some of them uh, with even advanced specialties as well. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing thing. And um, as I also said, we created a labor pool to augment right. those companies because they didn't want to necessarily grow any faster or further than um, demand was building. But, Yes, you're, you're right. Great. It's been important. And wh what's been the practical impediment for homeowners to make the plunge? Well, uh, you know, I think there are three things that we've addressed. One is the upfront cost of an audit. Um, traditionally, it had been $350, $450. One of the first things we did was sort of reverse the cost so that the cost remained the same, but we took it out of the end, pro the end check they got as an incentive. So the entry level was $100 rather than $450. And then there was concern that they wouldn't, they'd get a cheap audit or a free audit and not convert to a retrofit. But with assistance from just sort of understanding the process, our conversion rate is 44%. And that's wow. quite high nationally. But it's about talking to them and explaining it. The direct one-on-one -on -one interaction. Absolutely. And, and then it's, we offer construction management where that's important. Some people are working and don't have time to be at home for the work to be done, so we'll actually provide that service. And then we have um, a, a very affordable loan product that is um, also, in the minds of a lot of people, financing is, a, is an obstacle. We find it's less of an obstacle once the process understood. is understood by the individuals. Great. Well, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. And now uh, to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, gentlemen for Nebraska. appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, um, H.R. 1563 that Mr. Long talked about just as he was concluding, he left you about, I think, three seconds, Mr. Williams, uh, to discuss it. And uh, I want to get more, give, we'll use my time discussing if that's okay with you. But, uh, you know, his question was, which is interesting, he said it this way, what does the government have to do? And, and the one thing is, and for good reason, actually, uh, the government actually prevents some people from coming together to promote because they want to ensure competition in the marketplace and the system. My understanding is, as well, as I've spent a lot of time with this issue, is that most um, concrete masonry uh, businesses, are, well, almost all, are small. A lot of mom and pop shops that are local. Most, uh, most masonry is distributed within 50 miles of, of where it's produced. So you don't have the big players, you have a lot of small players in order to come together to promote their product. You just couldn't run a national campaign from Springfield, nor could you do national research 
from Springfield. And so the idea is to allow y'all to choose if you so choose. Uh, not being anti-competitive for the anti-competitiveness, but let you come together for the idea of not promoting your business, but promoting your product, which is a commodity, so it's not like you're promoting one or the other. And the other thing I think is even more important, quite honestly, is that you get to do research and development on products that may be uh, more appropriate for New England. We have a wonderful state of Vermont that I tell my friend Mr. Welch I enjoyed when I was in New England in college going up there. and. Uh, uh, but or, or hurricane resistant or hopefully someday tornado resistant as is, is very much on our minds today. So um, why is the, the I won't say brick and block, that's one in my area, but why is the, the concrete masonry business so small and so fractured and, and just disparate like it is? Well, I think you addressed a lot of it. It was for small family businesses operating in local areas. There's but why does the market for, kind of force that structure? Yeah, the market has forced it, and, and you bring up some, some good points. Of, and our ability to adapt and, and really get our word out. Um, you know, my pet peeves are on the uh, research and uh, education side of it. Um, you know, with, with the green building and energy code compliance we've heard so much about today, there's really a, a huge opportunities out there for our materials, whether it be utilizing fly ash in our materials, a higher percentage of fly ash, whether it be using crumb rubber, uh, waste in our, in our materials. There's opportunity to improve our energy efficiency, but, but lacking that opportunity to get in and really do the testing and how does it affect performance in terms of energy or fire protection. Um, you know, those are all things that require money and that consistent level of funding that we need over time. So a checkoff program for our industry would provide that consistent level of funding we need to advance our, uh, you know, our industry really in that education, research, and promotion. Yeah, my understanding is hard for one player to come in, and, and a lot of industries, you know, the industry that I have a family business and we sell the automotive, so in, for U.S. space companies, there are a lot of other companies, you know, the big three as we call them, have, you know, massive research and development, but it's difficult for you to do because you're so small, and I understand the reason you're small is because it's so expensive. You couldn't just have one plant in, in Springfield, Missouri and ship to, to New York City or to Vermont and try to produce because it's so expensive to do so, so they, perf they perform in the local. That's kind of why you're disparate yeah. and small, right? It would not, you know, shipping product that far would not be energy efficient. From, <laughs> from hey, that fits the theme, well, that's, that's even yeah. better. No, that, that's true, and, uh, you know, there's the checkoff program for us. You know, we see good support throughout our industry. Over 70% of through a third-party survey uh, have, have indicated that, yes, we need this, and it would be right for us. So you know, the, the fault we have is we don't fall in, we're not a product that grows, so we don't fall under the Department of Agriculture. We're doing this right. We belong under energy and commerce. And uh, unfortunately, being the first uh, program that would get set up, we need to go through the proper steps. And well, thanks for doing that. And um, so the proper steps, this bill does not create a checkoff program, does it? No. The, what does uh, the bill actually do? It gives do? us the authority to take a vote within our industry, and if it's approved by the uh, majority of, of uh, locations around the United States, then it would be enacted and oversaw. Uh, there would be a government oversight, but no cost would go into uh, monitoring that program. And if you looked at other checkout programs, is this different or is it similar? And similar in some ways, different Very than others? similar, yeah. There's over 35, I believe, uh, checkoff programs through the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the bill that's entered into the House is identical in the Senate, and they're based on that uh, logic that's been argued before the Supreme Court and uh, follows that same uh, legislative process. Or the you can't do it if you're promotional and only promotional in nature. You have to also yes, it, move your fact base and move your industry forward. And, and a good part it. about this, just real quick, is that 50% of the funds go back to the local markets, so the person in Springfield or, or uh, Bowling Green or whatever would have that opportunity to, to get back what they put in. Yeah, Springfield and Mr. Hammonds had a hotel in Bowling Green. I know y'all lost him this week, and that's yes, a big yes. loss to your community, and we prayers are with you all yes, and his family. Very uh, philanthropic individual. Thank you, and sorry, but there's no one else to ask questions. So that means our hearing is concluded. Remind you that there may be written questions submitted to you, and a timely response would be greatly appreciated. Um, so you are dismissed, and we are adjourned. Oh, and.